Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth edition of the Property Insurance Conference. Uh, this year, again, about dealing with the NATCAT risks and uh, trying to find solution to reduce the protection gap. Uh, this conference has, has traveled until now for six years in different countries. We started in Munich, we continued in Prague, uh, we had two editions in Vienna. And uh, well, for this year, I can't say actually where we are. We are welcoming you, you from the sunny Bucharest today, but given the fact that you are coming from about 25, 26 country, I don't know where to place exactly this conference today. Uh, anyway, we will uh, try to make it as interesting as, as possible uh, with the help of uh, a great team of speakers. And just to let you know what will happen today during about three hours, uh, I want to introduce my colleague, Mihaela Kirku. She's business development di director with Xprim. But today she's uh, together with me in our studio here in Bucharest and hosting you and helping us with uh, uh, conveying the questions to the speakers and uh, taking care of lots of other aspects. Mihaela, please. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Uh, welcome to the sixth edition of uh, this very interesting uh, conference dedicated to property uh, insurance. After uh, traveling to Munich, uh, Prague and uh, Vienna, now we are on uh, Zoom and uh, YouTube and uh, we hope many of uh, you will join us. Uh, in order to debate this very interesting topic of closing the protection gap. Uh, our conference will be structured in two parts, divided by a short coffee break. We will have, uh, during the first part, uh, a very interesting and exquisite uh, panel of speakers uh, with uh, three very interesting presentations and two panels of debates, uh, followed by a short break and the second part also very interesting with the two presentations and the debate panel. I'm waiting uh, here with your question on uh, Zoom and YouTube in order to pass them to our uh, uh, brilliant speakers. Uh, now back to you, Daniela, for the conference. Thank you. Well, uh, last year, uh, pandemics has stolen the stage for most other topics, but uh, it seems that nature didn't find out that we have uh, this almost exclusive concern. And uh, the extreme weather phenomenon continue to, to uh, occur and uh, affect countries, people, economies, and so on and so forth. And this is why uh, it seems that uh, we will never tire to, to speak about this topic. And uh, we will try today to see if we are better prepared to deal with it. I would say that in some respects, yes, in other, no. We will see what is to be done, what lessons are learned from the latest experience that we have and uh, what solution we can, uh, we can uh, uh, apply to improve things, taking opportunities offered by technology, by better cooperating, by bringing together all the forces that can contribute to redu reduction the protection gap. And uh, today we will start with a very special presentation given by Samantha Cook. Uh, she's senior financial sector specialist for the World Bank Crisis and Disaster Risks, Risks Finance. And uh, she brought us uh, in an absolute premiere, the results of a, of a study, of an, an analysis, sorry, conducted by the World Bank of the micro impacts of earthquakes and floods in European Union member states, and an analysis of the existing financial instruments to manage this risk and how this can be strengthened going forward. Uh, this study will be published later in June, as uh, Samalta told us. So uh, you are the very first uh, benefiting from the findings of it. Samantha, please, the floor is yours. Open your mic, please. Ah. Thanks, thanks, Daniela. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm never quite sure which time zone um, I happen to be speaking to these days. So um, very much a pleasure to be here um, and to be talking with, with all of you um, today. Let me just um, 
share my screen with you. If you can let me know when you can you can see it, that would be that would be great. Okay, I, I can see it in the background of your screen, Daniela. So that's that's great. So um, by way of introduction, uh, I'm Samantha Cook, senior financial sector specialist. I have been working, um, to use your terminology, in NAT cat risk um, for about 15 years now, um, starting many, many moons ago in one of the most impacted um, regions of the world over in uh, the Pacific. Now I, I tend to, or previously in pre-COVID days, um, I was somewhat of a, a human ping pong ball going all over the, the globe. This project um, though that I'm about to share with you today, um, I have to say this has been one of my um, pet pieces of research ultimately because for, for many, many years, um, the European Union has been a, a huge advocate for disaster risk finance. They've provided millions and hundreds of millions um, towards building the financial resilience within developing countries. But this was actually the first time that they holistically wanted to look at disaster risk finance, by which I mean the amount of risk that they were holding um, on their books. So that that was quite um, it was it was very it was a very unique moment when this happened. So very excited that this is the start of the conversation and very excited to continue and see what, what can happen on the back of it. So for framing, I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction as to what we at the bank specifically mean by disaster risk financing. Um, I'll give you a short overview of what's in the analysis um, and try and go through it block by block as to the different components. And then I guess the most interesting part would be the, the key findings and the key, the key messages. So what, what ultimately can you within the NatCat sector take away from this? Um, so from our side, I've already alluded to this, um, we're very much focused on the resilience aspects when it comes to um, disaster risk in particular. And we like to look at this from three different perspectives and we view them as reinforcing. So um, starting with physical resilience, what can you do to um, reduce your risk by having stronger building codes, using um, new technologies to strengthen that physical resilience, linking through to your social resilience, very much akin to your residential, to your housing, to these aspects, and also your financial resilience. What can you do to make sure that you have ultimately money for a rainy day um, is the way in which to look at it, so that you can then repair any damage to your physical assets. Hopefully it's not interfered with the social aspects, with your housing, um, nor your, your gainful employment. So these are the sorts of things that we, we try and look at. And we do this, so this is, we have four principles of disaster risk finance. I'm just gonna talk about the first one here because I feel that many of you will, will know and already understand this. Um, this. This graphic, it comes up a lot. So what we try and demonstrate from this graphic is ultimately that you should look for financial instruments um, akin to their cost. So for your most frequent events, don't try and use your, your expensive risk transfer instruments, try and manage them through your own financial resources. So if you as an individual um, think of this as your, your deductible on your car insurance policy, you have, um, you have a pre-agreed limit that you yourself will manage should something happen to your car. If you're in, um, a more severe car accident, that is where you're, you would expect your car insurance to come in. Same principles apply um, to the different magnitudes of, of disasters. Um, so basically what we're trying to do very much when we're talking to governments is to reinforce that um, governments in particular, they face both an implicit and explicit liability by which I mean um, an explicit liability will be some form of contractual obligation that the government has to respond to, for example, repairing the Ministry of Finance when that building gets damaged. And the implicit, that's the social aspect. So providing support financially, um, potentially temporary accommodation in the event um, of a major disaster. Those are your implicit liabilities, the protection of your, your constituents. So the, the objectives um, of this report, and this again, first time that this has been done, 
is to try and quantify the macro fiscal impacts of natural disasters within the EU. Um, we wanted to do this by um, doing some analysis of the financial instruments that um, countries have in place, also looking at the impacts on GDP. Um, there's also a parallel piece of research which looked at um, the return on investments within disaster risk reduction as well. Um, but that one I won't be talking about today. Um, so the components in the macro fiscal analysis, um, what we have is we um, developed two or we worked with two agencies um, to develop consistent modeling across 27 member states of the, the EU. And we got an indication of the funding gap based upon available information on instruments at the country level um, and also at the EU level. So looking at the EU Solidarity Fund, for example, and then we developed some options to strengthen this financial resilience. So with the, with the CAT modelling itself, um, this was a bit of a surprise to us. Ultimately, um, there was not across the 27 member states, um, we could not find um, consistent probabilistic information detailing consistently by the same metric, um, the hazard, exposure and vulnerability data um, in order to be able to get the impact and risk elements um, so we worked with JBA risk management for fluvial and surface flood water, and also the Global Earthquake Model Foundation for seismic risk. So what, what we did is for the 27 member states, um, we then got estimates using a, a common methodology um, on building assets, residential, commercial, industrial, healthcare, and education building. So it's, it's quite a large data set as you're beginning to imagine. And, and this is ultimately step one um, of our analysis. So what we then um, were able to do, that this is the, the first bit. So this was the, the output looking at seismic losses. What you have on the, the left-hand side, as you look at the screen, is you have your average annual loss by country. Um, and you can see that there's quite a lot of red, particularly, um, particularly within, within Italy. So Italy by far has the, the highest level of seismic risk. I don't think that's particularly surprising. It's about 6 billion. And it was, um, it was then followed by Greece, but Greece was quite far, um, quite far below with their risk being 1.1 billion. The charts on the, the right-hand side of your screen what this shows is the average annual loss ratio. And what, what you will see is that you'll see slight differences starting to, to emerge because this is ultimately looking at your loss relative to the total asset value in each of the, the subregions. So all of the little lines you can, you can see indicate the subregion within, within the country. Um, and what actually happened here and why I, I placed this analysis here is Italy dropped from being... Um, the most exposed in terms of average annual loss, down to the fourth when you look at average annual loss ratios. And what this ultimately demonstrates is it's really important that you know where the concentration of your assets are. Um, are they in high risk areas? So are your major cities in the most at risk areas? Or are they in a, low, a lower risk area? Because that can ultimately impact this average annual loss ratio. Um, Can you, can you still hear me? Sorry, I got a message that I was muted. I'm, gonna, I'm going to continue unless I, I hear otherwise. Um, so comparing this to the, the flood, again, we have the, the same thing, but this is only for residential information here. Again, I thought it would be useful just to present the comparison of the average annual loss to the average annual loss ratio. What you see with flood is Germany um, faces the highest average annual losses, 7.9 billion. France follows closely at 5.4 um, and Italy at 2 billion. Whereas in comparison, when you look at the average annual loss ratio, Romania, Slovenia and Latvia, they have the highest risk relative to the replacement cost of their building stock. And that's, that's just from the outputs of these, these models. So what were we using these, these outputs for? 
um, we were ultimately putting them within our macro model along with the information that we had on risk financing instruments. So what we looked at at the, the national level were the national reserve funds, any funds dedicated towards disaster response itself. Um, we also looked at general contingencies fund where we couldn't find a national reserve fund to try and develop some sort of proxy for the amount of cash that would be available following a disaster. Contingent lines of credit, those that are pre-agreed that you access after an event. Um, we also looked at household and public asset insurance, the European Union Solidarity Fund, and the civil protection mechanism. They were the, the two primary mechanisms that we, we were looking at within, um, within the, the EU level analysis. Um, so what we did um, with the disaster risk financing instrument, so we have to make assumptions um, at some point, and so we used the assumptions of the solidarity fund for the share of contingency funds and reserves um, to try and get some estimate as to how much money was, was available. Um, we, we also looked at the emergency response cost for floods and earthquakes. We also tried to identify the share of insured public assets and I'll go back to that one in a moment. Um, and also the losses covered by governments. We made some assumptions um, as to the level of liabilities that governments would, would ultimately be facing. So when, when we were trying to look um, for information on insurance, we, we actually found there was a, a huge breadth in terms of what was reported. So you, you had countries which had 97% coverage on the one hand, and then you had other countries which had almost none. Um, so it was, it was quite, quite interesting. So France, Finland, Slovakia, Sweden, um, and Ireland, they're the ones that have the coverage or the highest levels of coverage against both earthquake and flood. But we also found that there were some anomalies. Um, for example, in Hungary, it basically it didn't look like, and we couldn't find the information. So if it's, it's there, we, we certainly didn't find it. Um, we saw no households covered against flood risk but almost 70% of households had earthquake cover. So there were, were some variances across the, the type of hazards. And again, this, this could be to do with the perceptions that the households have as to what they're, they're most exposed to. Um, so what we did, this is the structure. This is a very simple representation of the structure of the model. Um, to walk you through it from left to right, we took the, the outputs of the flood and earthquake models Again, emphasizing that this is losses to industrial, commercial, health, education, and residential sectors. We, we then did some, some simula uh, simulations of the flood and earthquake events over the next 30 years. Um, so there was some standardization which was done um, within the data. And this um, standardized data, we then applied the, the solo swan growth model um, with using some GDP data, which we correlated. So we had two, two primary sources of data for, um, for GDP. We used Eurostat, um, and there's also the EU aging population report. We wanted to correlate and make sure we were consistent with the latest information coming out from the commission itself. So we used that combined with the risk financing inputs, which I just mentioned, those instruments that we could identify, um, so we ran the GDP growth model to see the impact on growth and also the fiscal impact model. And this fiscal impact model is really what's going to give you the liabilities. Um, and what we got from this were, were GDP projections and fiscal variables for the, the standardized information of which the, by this point we're starting to get huge volumes of information. So 1,000 realizations for each of the 27 member states over the, the next 30 years. So I've, I've just placed here today, I haven't given a full summary of the analysis, but I, I placed here today things which I thought would be of particular interest to you. So liabilities, and there are some key takeaways here for you within the NatCat sector. So we looked at a low liability scenario and a high liability scenario. So in the low liability of scenario, we assumed that one third of public assets are insured that the government covers household losses proportional to the number of households at risk of poverty. So those at risk of falling below the poverty line. And then on the right hand side, you'll see the high government liability 
where we assume that public assets are not covered and that the government covers all household losses. So there's a significantly larger amount of risk sitting on the government books. Um, and what you can see is that in both instances, the highest liabilities um, by far are ultimately from um, households, because you see the ultimately the households transfers over to the government side between the low liability scenario and the government scenario. So in both instances, um, the an average annual liabilities are over 50%. And that's just so we're clear, is from um, damage to households and public assets, nothing, nothing else. Um, at that point, there are also other elements um, looking at the private sector as well. So to conduct the, the funding gap analysis, again, we're, we're starting to get a little bit more complex here. Um, so taking the outputs of the macro fiscal model um, and the information specifically on the disaster risk financing instruments available, we, we looked at three different strategies that member states and the EU itself could potentially have. Um, so the, we had the base strategy, which is ultimately the status quo. We then had strategy B, which is the hypothetical strategy where the European Solidarity Funds covers more losses and more contingent finance is available. So we just assumed a higher proportion um, of finance was available to countries. And then the third strategy, again, hypothetical, um, is where the European Union Solidarity Fund is activated to cover more frequent events. So at the moment, there is a minimum loss that you need to incur for the Solidarity Fund to kick in. In strategy C, ultimately what we did was we lowered um, that level. What we have also assumed is that this funding gap will be covered by budget reallocation, debt or donor assistance. So here is where we start to, to present the findings. Um, it comes as no surprise, disasters can have sizable macro fiscal impacts um, within the EU. Um, and what you can see here is ultimately between the two, two different scenarios, the countries most exposed remain relatively consistent. The order may change, um, but they still remain relatively consistent. Um, so within the low liability scenario, Without accounting, without taking um, disaster risk finance into account, liabilities can be as high as half a percent of GDP um, for each year. And in the high liability scenario, this can basically go up to, to 1%, as was the case for, for Cyprus. And you'll see that Cyprus swaps from second place in the low government liability to, to first place um, within the high liability scenario. So not, not really a competition you would want to, to win, but just interesting to demonstrate how these liabilities change dependent upon the assumptions that you make. This, this chart I found particularly interesting. Um, this is where we were looking at the EU level funding gap. Um, and ultimately what we found is that across the EU, and this is ultimately the, the aggregate of losses across all 27 member states, um, the losses can be as high as 50 billion for very severe events. Um, what, we, what we also found is that there's very little, compared to that number, there's very little finance on hand to manage that risk. In fact, it's so little that on average, it can only cover 4% of total liabilities each year. And you, you can see that very clearly from the chart on the right-hand side, where the funding gap is represented by the, the largest red column. So the funding gap analysis also suggested that, um, and you, you will have begun to have gotten a sense of this from the liabilities, is that incentivizing insurance um, will have great returns in terms of reducing the amount of risk that the government has to manage. Um, in some instances, it actually served to half the government liabilities, so reducing them from 100 billion to 50 billion. Um, this was um, something that we found particularly interesting, and we kept getting reinforcing messages across this level, despite the limited information that we were able to find about public asset insurance. Um, it seemed that um, the more we played with it to increase the uptake of that instrument, 
the more beneficial it became. Um, EU level instruments, while they're designed to only cover a small fraction of response, and that is by design, it's done on purpose, um, there is a 10% probability in any given year that the EU will experience earthquake events severe enough to produce losses that countries can't sustain from their national reserves. And that will use at least 660 million. So that's the, the threshold. Um, it's the, the maximum you can get from the Solidarity Fund. Um, so it will use all national resources plus those available at the regional level. Um, so that's, that's quite a high level of, of loss that's on the books. Um, I'll go very quickly through these. Um, again, they're very much reinforcing what we said. Um, so on average, within the member states of the EU, 35% um, of liabilities in the low, um, the low liability scenario to 64% in the high liability scenario are retained by the government and are expected to be financed through ad hoc instruments. Again, this starts presenting the case for, for the uptake for insurance um, combined with other instruments. Introducing risk financing instruments can help reduce the macro fiscal impacts of disasters. Um, there's a great example within France itself um, with their NatCap program. Um, their DRF instruments help reduce government liabilities for a one in 100 year event by 3.6 billion. Um, that was quite an important um, finding. Definitely lessons can be, can be learned from that example. We discovered that most countries, um, they do have funding in place to manage those much smaller, much more localized events. So they can, they can through the existing instruments of contingency funds, reserve funds, they can manage their average annual losses for earthquakes and floods. What we don't know is whether that will then hold as we introduce additional perils. Um, and then the last point is that approximately 40% of countries lack pre-arranged funding needed to cover a one in 10 year event. So something that's relatively frequent, um, there's insufficient funding. So while they're well covered for average annual losses, less so for those less frequent events. So the, the key takeaway point so that ultimately the existing disaster risk financing instruments, policies and strategies are limited. The financial preparedness can be strengthened to improve that resilience beyond the average annual losses. Um, insurance would be a great application combined with those reserve instruments, combined with the regional instruments in order to help manage that risk. But we also wanted to highlight, um, ultimately, finance alone can't solve the challenges posed by climate change. One of the, the issues we factored into the analysis was how the risk would change over time with climate changes, which, of course, is particularly pertinent for flood. Um, but we just wanted to make that point that ultimately, unless you have the correct policy levers in place to drive change, um, as well as incorporating this with your physical and social resilience, finance alone isn't going to help you. You need some, some reinforcement in terms of your policy there. Um, last, but by no means least, data and analytics are fundamental for informed decision-making. But as we found, and this was really quite surprising for us, um, at the moment, the data is limited. So if there's one thing that I can definitely encourage it would certainly be to, to keep building upon this data set, incorporate additional hazards, try and find a better way of communicating um, on public asset insurance to try and get a clearer picture of what's there, um, to be able to better advocate um, for the uptake of, of things like public asset insurance and residential insurance. Um, and with that, um, I say thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, it was quite interesting. I think we already have a question for you from uh, yes. our attendees. Uh, yes, you, uh, we have a question from one attendee from Romania, I think, that uh, can uh, that ask you to give more details about the earthquake exposure and potential losses for Romania. Of course, we, if you have, the, have them handy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... 
Uh, no, that, that information I don't have um, off the top of my head. I'm assuming that this comes from the um, comparison from average annual losses to the average annual loss ratio. Um, I think this is a question which is, which is going to, to keep coming back. Um, people, for very obvious reasons, are very interested um, in, their, in their own countries. Um, for Romania, what I remember, um, and certainly what I remember from, from visiting there, is Romania does have a, a high level of loss from, from earthquake events um, due to ultimately the difference in building standards. Um, so the application of modern building codes is still is still coming through, and there are significant weaknesses from the the beautiful um, existing architecture, your historic architecture that that exists. It's there, but it do, it does need reinforced. Um, I can certainly get back to you with the more specific loss information um, on Romania, but I just I don't have it on my on my screen just now, so I apologise for that. Uh, no problem with that. We can uh, we can always come back uh, later. Uh, I would just uh, uh, want to ask you something else. In this comparison at EU level, could you um, identify some differences between, let's say, the group of uh, C countries, the latest? Uh, uh, EU members and the Western countries in respect to this uh, funding gap and uh, the, the financial meanings at disposal in case of a, a big natural catastrophe? So it, it was actually, it was somewhat of a, a mixed bag. Um, and this I found particularly interesting. So I mentioned contingent credit. Um, within my presentation, what the more astute of you will have noticed is I mentioned it at the beginning and then I did not mention it again. Um, and the reason for this is there's only actually one member state that has some form of contingent credit, and that actually happens to be Romania. Um, so in some instances, Romania, while um, they may have a high level of risk, they're starting to recognize this and starting to have some pre-planned financing in place to help manage that risk. Um, what we saw, particularly with flood risk, um, the countries that are most well covered, um, as I mentioned, France, Ireland, Finland, not necessarily unexpected, um, again, very much dependent upon, upon the risk profile. We, we also find it somewhat easier to, to find information um, for the Eastern European countries when it came to public access insurance. Um, Poland, we know, um, has a very good insurance sector. Um, this was something, so because of this, things were well reported. It was relatively easy to find information on it. Um, so proportionately, they, they look as if they have a high level of uptake of insurance against um, NAPCAT risk. Um, again, I'm at, high, I'm at high risk here of being co um, contradicted by one of, by one of the panelists here, but that's that's fine with <laughs> that's <laughs> fine with me because this is based upon the information that, that we found. Um, so it it wasn't as simple as being able to um, classify it purely by region um, or sub region within the the EU. Nor was it as simple as correlating it to um, where the hazards are, so your hazard match, you couldn't correlate it there either. It, it really actually transpired to be, to be a mixed bag. And again, I think part of it is because um, to a large extent, I think it's always been viewed as somebody else's issue. Okay, um, thank you. And I you think there are some uh, conversations that happen around that. Okay, uh, I have uh, uh, just uh, one last uh, question of a practical nature. When will be the study published? Will it be available for the large public? Where, how, <laughs> when should we wait it and uh, maybe read it? So the, the launch event from the report, which will make it public, um, will be done by the Director General of ECHO, um, and that will be on June 7th, at which point the three reports from the overarching study will become available, of which this one on financial risk and opportunities will be one of them. And it will be available on both 
the European Union site and also the, the World Bank site from that point. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will meet again, Samantha, in the panel in the end of uh, the conference. So if there are uh, other questions for her, just uh, uh, keep them handy because we will have another opportunity to find out uh, her answers. Uh, as uh, Samantha was speaking, the, the earthquake uh, come, came in the, in the conversation again and again. And uh, in fact, in our region, earthquake was uh, by far the star risk last year with uh, two major events and uh, tens of replicas or maybe hundreds of replica in uh, Croatia and another one in uh, Turkey. And um, this is why uh, I thought it would be interesting to hear from uh, these countries about the event itself and the losses, the way that the insurance industry has coped with helping uh, covering these losses, especially also because the two countries have very different, a very different approach towards the net cat uh, recovery fin financing. So we will start with uh, our friend, with Hrvoje Pavkovic. Uh, he is managing director for the Croatian Insurance Bureau and uh, will give us a short presentation on what happened in Croatia last year in uh, quake terms. Please, Hrvoje. Uh, I think you need to unmute. Hello. Hello. Uh, How hell, we hello, hear everyone. You? Good day to everyone. Thank you, Daniela, for inviting me to participate in this important conference. I hope I will be able to share with you some of the creation experience regarding earthquake and the natural hazards that we have faced in the last couple of years that have really shook creation economy as, the, as well as the insurance industry as well. Uh, so uh, allow me to start uh, with a couple of sentences regarding what we have seen in the past, uh, past years. So we had extensive floods in the Eastern Slavonia region in 2014 with ex uh, damages exceeding 170 million euros. We had a catastrophic fires in the Dalmatia with the damages exceeding 25 million euros. And of course, last year we had uh, two major earthquakes in terms of Croatia. They were rather significant because we were not really used to having them. But last year, unfortunately, we had some terrific instances in which a lot of damages were, was incurred. Please allow me to, if I may, share a couple of seconds of video from those two catastrophes that you might get uh, the impression what really has happened. First, the earthquake. This is the Petrenja region, south of west of Zagreb, southeast of Zagreb, a small city which was practically devastated in full. You could see all the remains and the clearings of something. So basically the whole region was, the whole city was targeted and practically destroyed in total. The government helped everyone pitched in, of course, and the international community, but the work is ongoing and it's going to be at least uh, five to 15 years until the area is recovered and restored in full. On the other hand, please allow me to share some of the Sorry. Some of the footage of the floods that we have experienced in Eastern Slavonia region, but only not only Eastern Slavonia, also the neighboring countries were hit. So you could see also the extensive damage that we have faced. And this is something unfortunately becoming relatively a common matter also in Croatia. I have to stress that we have not really seen such disastrous events since we have seen them in the past five years, in decades. So it came quite as a shock to the society, to the economy, 
and to the government and politics as well. So going back to the presentation, some numbers regarding the earthquake that has hit us. So the estimated damages are 16.9 billion euros. The damages incurred in earthquake in Zagreb, which hit us in March, along with pandemic, only represent 11.4 billion euros of damages, which is roughly 60% of the annual state budget. The earthquake that actually hit us between Christmas and New Year's Eve uh, in Sisak, Petrinja and Zagreb region amounted to 5.5 billion euros of damages. We have unusable buildings around in thousands, along with temporary unusable buildings also as well in counting in town, thousands. But what disappoints is the claims paid by the insurance. I'm not saying this as a chairman of the insurance association in the sense that I have to complain to the insurance industry. On the contrary, we have done our part. We paid claims immediately, resolved them and helped a lot of people along with numerous donations to the public hospitals and as well to the people. However, our damages paid by the April 1st of this year amount to 50.4 million euros. So it's a large contrast, 16.9 billion euros in comparison to 50.4 million euros. Unfortunately, what has happened? Why is the damage so ex extensive and why the insurance industry could not have helped more? Well, the problem lies in the fact that a significant portion of the property in Croatia is not adequately or is not assured at all. And the contribution of the insurance could have been much larger and our help could have been more uh, extended if the Croatian citizens, institutions, public sector companies had adequate insurance coverage, but they did not. What is the reason for that? Uh, unfortunately, insurance density in, uh, when you compare insurance density in Croatia and with the numbers of EU in regarding in terms of property, you can see there are large discrepancy that Croatia, the average Croatian person spends roughly 50 euros per capita on property insurance, while the European standard is more than three times higher. The same situation goes in terms of life insurance, health insurance, as well as in motor vehicle insurance. So roughly insurance density in Croatia is 350 euros in comparison to more than 2000 euros in the EU. If you compare it with the insurance penetration is 2.6 percent the ratio between premium and gdp it's not also on the sufficient level so we are not really this here represents the answer why vast number of properties has not have not been insured properly this is also one of the insurance europe i would say data represented where Croatia lies among the more developed and not so developed countries in the region and also within the EU. So the importance of property insurance is of course extremely important, but the penetration and density demonstrates that there is an insufficient amount of property insurance compared to EU countries. Raising the level of awareness of the citizens remain a high priority for the, for the insurance industry, but as well for the educational system as well as for the government. And what the message from the insurance sector goes is that the property insurance or any kind of insurance reduces the financial burden of the state in the repair of damages. This is something that uh, unfortunately, I, I think I, our public and the government and the establishment has learned uh, the hard way through this national hazards and disasters that occurred. And I think uh, in the future, we will see much more attention being paid to insurance industry and the products that we distribute. This is also on the next slide. We see uh, a quarter, first quarter in, in terms of insurance, earthquake insurance, we see a premium growth of 90%. And also in the number of insurance policies, we also see a, a growth of more than 100%. This gives some, some encouraging news to the insurance industry, but also uh, helps us, uh, I would say, determine that the level of awareness has 
uh, has has risen in terms, but also all only in the fact that all these national disasters really did occur. So these are the numbers for Croatia. What uh, remains our continuous task is that we here demonstrate uh, the map of Croatia and of course uh, the map of the earthquakes in Europe. But uh, what is significant for Croatia that not of many of our people are aware that 30% of the surface of the Republic and the 60% of the population is in danger. And this is the message that we are trying to send uh, to the public, to the government sector, to the communities in order for in, uh, to instill some trust in the insurance industry and demonstrate if you have insurance, you will be able to recover the damages much, much sooner. And how does the government respond to that? Uh, state response in terms of legislative action has been uh, really differing. When we had these floods in Eastern Slavonia region, there was a legislative sol solution which was completely inadequate because the, the, the law required that all the damages paid by the insurers had to be surrendered to the state budget. Because they said, if you want some help from the state, you must surrender all the ev eventual claims paid or the damages paid by the insurance industry and surrender it to the state budget. Basically, this area was not dense in terms of insurance. So this was not a, a strategic issue. However, it really did send a wrong message. Basically, it sent a message, if you have insurance, it doesn't really matter. You have to surrender it to the state budget. Otherwise, you will not be receiving any help in the future. When we had these earthquakes in Zagreb and Sisak region, then we lobbied for and of course we corrected the solution and the state uh, declared by law that it will cover 60 percent of the damages the city of zagreb will pay 20 percent and the owner is uh, takes care of the remaining 20 percent however whatever was insured represents a valid contribution to the owner in order for them not to be able, uh, not to be forced to surrender the, the damages to the state uh, state budget. What we are now lobbying for is compulsory building insurance. Of course, uh, building building uh, specifically where building consists of multiple apartments or flats, and uh, we are looking forward to this draft bill, which we are part of, and we are strongly lobbying for it because it really specifically names the risks which have to be included in the insurance cover. Because so far, our property law says that Croatian property has to be adequately insured. Adequately in Croatia means give me the cheapest policy. So the cheapest policy, of course, did not uh, have the coverage of earthquake. It was basic fire policy and whatever it goes along with it. But now we are seeing that we have expli explicitly includes the seismic risk and it's being taken into account within the law and hopefully we will see this law being implemented in the fall and hopefully by january 1st next year at least the buildings will consist of multiple flats or apartments will have to cover of course taking into the account the risk area also the earthquake uh, risk along with some uh, specific risk which are explicitly written in this draft bill of course we are of course uh, we are constantly uh, alert because we really strongly fear that due to political reasons uh, the government will not impose financial obligations to the owner although it's not would not be a right step so basically the right step would be if you own property you have to have it insured because otherwise uh, the state cannot pitch in every time and this is something that we struggle in Croatia because the sense of personal responsibility and liability is not high. We always look up to the state and seek for some government and state solutions. And this is something which is, of course, negative. So we have to change the perception and, of course, the, 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 the behavior of the public. Uh, we are also working highly on raising the level of financial literacy as a challenge for us. Of course, uh, we have highly complex pro uh, products and we are trying to push them on the market. But of course, uh, we respect highly with all the European legislation and specifically IDD. And we want to have a financially literate citizen 
who understands insurance products and who sees the potential insurance solution as a solution for their own risks. So we basically want to present them and say, okay, look, look at the risk around you and look at some of the insurance solutions uh, that we have in place and please choose adequately. This is something that we do permanently. We do uh, also a lot of projects with the youngsters. Uh, this is the, the, the famous, uh, I would say, game regarding, regarding raising level of insurance, which is called less risk, more fun, developed uh, primarily by the Austrians and then localized on the Croatian uh, market. And we have done uh, uh, numerous uh, press conference and pr uh, numerous, I would say, events. And we have donated to each and every school and university uh, several copies of this uh, game. Uh, game is, of course, aiming to raise the awareness of uh, risks uh, which are uh, threatening everyone and potentially directing them towards the solution of insurance. Uh, the same we do with the, uh, we cooperate highly with the Insurance Europe because we are, of course, a member. We localize our their leaflets along with our leaflets and of course try to distribute them electronically and the other way around so basically trying to raise the awareness we are also trying to send the message that this such natural disasters are uh, always threatening and that the insurance solution is one of the contributing factors that can diminish the negative effects of such an events uh, so that will be all from my side. Thank you very much for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions if there were some. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hirboe. We will uh, for sure take uh, questions just a little later because uh, we will meet you again in a couple of minutes in the panel of discussions. Uh, uh, my proposition is now to hear from uh, Mrs. Menekshe Ucharolu. She is CEO of the Istanbul Underwriting Center and will uh, uh, give us uh, an image of the earthquake and uh, of the losses and the whole situation in Turkey after uh, last year's uh, Izmir earthquake, which was uh, a quite significant one, I think, and affected, in fact, more than Turkey, also the surrounding areas. Menekşe, the floor is yours, please. Hello, I hope you hear me. Yes. And with your permission, I am sharing my screen. Okay, is it all right? Yana? Yes. Great. We are... Okay, hello everyone. Actually, it's quite pity uh, for me uh, to be obliged to do this uh, presentation online and so far from uh, a wonderful place anywhere in the world and instead being in my living room uh, which is not very encouraging as I have been doing this for last one year <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I'm sure most of you are in similar similar, uh, similar uh, psychology uh, but still um, we are uh, struggling and uh, I hope uh, and I think that the insurance market will be coming out of this uh, crisis as always with a success because I think that the uh, strength of insurance professionals are really uh, very high, especially in terms of crisis. Now, uh, regarding the, the case, uh, uh, Daniela asked me to prepare a short presentation. So I will not go too much into detail Actually, uh, all these information that I will share are uh, open to public. So these are uh, not the um, uh, critical and hidden informations about TCIP. And there is no such thing. The, the most important part, uh, I guess, is that the Turkish um, companies, especially the manager of TCIP, before uh, first Milli, then Eureka Sigorta, and recently Tukri, they are all very open and very uh, communicative regarding the cases and if, during the latest uh, Izmir earthquake each day they were sharing all the informations online uh, for the public so this is quite important for uh, everyone to understand for the reinsurers for the 
insurance market and for the people to understand what's going on. Uh, just a quick reminder, all this TCIP, all this uh, earthquake pool has started following the, this devastating earthquake in Marmara in year 1999. And after this 99 earthquake, insurance companies and the government have started to think how we can cope with, with this size of earthquakes because uh, most of the households were not insured and uh, all this burden was on the shoulders of the government. So after that, and after having this uh, insured loss, which is $800 million and uninsured economical loss, uh, which is $10 billion, uh, was a good motive uh, to start TCIP uh, after uh, this first earthquake. Then today, uh, what is our situation? Now I have found my latest presentation, which was in beautiful uh, Bucharest, and uh, in year 2018, uh, and there I have seen that I have shared with you some figures. So I thought that it will be good to update them. Now in year 2018, uh, the uh, penetration of TCIP policies was 48% with regard to the general uh, number of houses. Today, uh, it is 57.7%. So at that time, I remember we, there were some questions to me, how do we see this penetration and do we expect to have more penetration? And I said, yes. And then we see that here, there is a, is a real success. For the time being, in Turkey, the policies in force are approximately uh, 10.5 million uh, policies, which are for 17.5 million houses. So it's a, it's a quite a good success. And uh, you see the increase of policies and the premium did remain the same. Of course, in Turkish lira, it has increased, but uh, in, dollar, in dollar terms, I'm sure most of you, you know that we had some problems uh, uh, with regard to the currency and Unfortunately, uh, with regard to US dollar and euro and other hard currencies, we lost a little bit our position. Hope we will recover, but for the time being, uh, it is quite, it's really cheap insurance, I might say. And it is, uh, the penetration is very high. Uh, and when we move on the, the coverage and uh, what do we cover? The coverage here is for the damage caused by earthquake and the following incidents like fire, explosion, tsunamis, and landslides. Uh, the compulsory insurance is, uh, is aiming to enable the people to continue their lives, uh, hopefully they stay alive, with a direct support of cash. And I, when I will come to the situation in the Izmir earthquake, I will give you how we have reacted to that. And uh, the sum in short is 215,000 Turkish lira. If you divide it by eight, um, approximately $30,000. Because it's almost one to eight. The system is very basic. I wanted to share with you, any of you, if you go to the premium calculator anytime, you can calculate how much uh, you will pay for this insurance. And in case of an incident, Magdewood, you can, if you want to search the policy, by keying in this four information, you can easily find your policy. So having access to information is quite pratic and uh, fully automized and digitalized. And that's why it's very uh, user-friendly. When I can, uh, when I wanted to share with you some figures, you can see here the uh, policy number, increase in policies and increase in premium. And in year 2020, uh, the total premium is 1.6 million Turkish lira. And uh, it, there is almost 10 million policies. Of course, this uh, within these uh, four months, we have added to this almost 3 million policies more and then we reach 10.2 million policy numbers and you see that each year it's an 
it's an increase. Regional wise, you can see here that the, the largest cities and the largest capital cities like Istanbul, Izmir, Ankara, Bursa, Antalya, they have more penetration than the general average of the country. Oh, uh, you see Marmara region is one of the leading area where you have Istanbul and Bursa there. It's a 69%. And uh, when you check uh, here, the ratio looks uh, lower, but in reality, Antalya and Izmir, they have high ratio, but because of the other rural cities, the average ratio seems lower. lower. So we can see that even if in the general of the Turkish market, it's below 60%, in largest capital cities, it's more than 60%, almost 70%, which here, this is Istanbul. And you see that the, the almost half of the premium volume is coming from the Marmara region. So it is uh, it has a real impact on the final results. When we come to this uh, topic of our agenda, the Izmir earthquake, which has happened as the center was in Seferihisar, that's why it is registered as Seferihisar on the 30th of uh, October uh, 2020. Uh, we had a claim file numbers of approximately 19,000 files were open, and so far uh, 308 million uh, Turkish lira, billion Turkish lira, sorry, was paid. And uh, this is uh, when Seferisar uh, hit and dusk the DCIP team were there on the same day, because uh, I'm sure you will remember it happened during the day. So the whole team, including the general manager, the whole team, which is now managed by Turkey, they were there and they started to react immediately because as you know, people are left, even though they are not dead or not the houses are not, totally demolished, it's, it, but it's damaged. They need immediate money to go to have some, uh, some hotel room or somewhere near. And that's why the TCIP team, they were there on the spot and started to give even cash uh, money uh, before waiting for the survey report. So to help people. So really this was a good, um, a big, I mean, examination maybe for the team which were very, very successful. You see that in, in the history since year 2000, we have two large incidents. One, one is the one earthquake, which was in 2011, you see here. And the other big one is the Izmir earthquake. But in between, during the year, you see several earthquakes are happening. You are not noticing them. For example, in year uh, 2019, 91 earthquake happened and it was paid. So actually TCIP, even though we realize when something big happens, but daily, almost daily, it's a, it's a pool which is paying claims. And uh, since, the, since the beginning, they have paid 847 billion Turkish lira claims. And approximately since the beginning, 1037 earthquakes has happened in last 20 years so 1037 earthquakes big or small uh, is a is a very very large number and uh, the total uh, claim files is approximately uh, 90000 files uh, 86000 files were opened in last 20 years but almost uh, 53000 was just uh, for six months ago. Uh, yes, this is the situation. The Seferisar earthquake happened, uh, Izmir earthquake happened and uh, TCIP was there. The penetration is, is very high. And how did, did we succeed this penetration? Of course, there are room to go. There are still room to go. Uh, but the registration for the uh, electricity and water um, company uh, is uh, subject to the policy. So even if you are renting a house, you need to present this uh, policy of TCIP in order to be able to register for the electricity and uh, for the uh, water. Uh, 
So this is important. Plus, when you sell or buy a house, when you go to the title office, you need to present your policy. But the most important is the other one. Of course, what about the people who are not selling or buying their houses and who are not registering for electricity or, uh, or water? It's up to them because there is no other uh, uh, control so far. Uh, but even with, with this result, we are almost 60% penetrated, which we find very, very important, especially for Marmara region, which is on the zone one uh, to the Cresta earthquake zones. Uh, uh, Daniela asked me to make a small presentation, so I have prepared a very small presentation, but I will be more than pleased to uh, answer any question that uh, you may have. Uh, for sure, we will have questions for you, Menekshe. In fact, uh, this is what is happening right now uh, because we will start a panel of discussions. Uh, I will ask Menekshe and Hirwe to, to stay with us. Uh, and uh, I am also inviting uh, our third panelist, Mrs. Nicoleta Radu. Uh, she is uh, CEO of the Romanian uh, NATCAD pool, PAID in the Romanian acronym. Uh, a pool that covers the main risks of uh, natural catastrophe uh, in Romania. So, uh, dear panelists, I will, uh, uh, I hope to see you soon all the three of you on my screen. Uh, until then, uh, I would like to ask you to very shortly comment a little bit on the uh, level of insurance protections for natural catastrophes in your country, because you are coming from three countries with very different risks profiles, uh, different approaches to financing recovery, and uh, in fact, in the end, different situation in terms of uh, protection, uh, uh, insurance protection for uh, these risks. Uh, let's start with Nicoletta because she's new in our panel. So yeah. what would you say about the, the insurance protection actually existing in our country? for uh, natural catastrophes. Hello, Daniela. Hello, everybody. Um, as uh, everybody knows, Romania is one of the most exposed country to a few catastrophic risk, risks, to be more exactly uh, three of them, earthquake, landslide, and floods. And the Romanian uh, pool uh, was uh, set up to provide uh, homeowners uh, with a simple, affordable uh, insurance product to secure uh, their homes against uh, uh, these three risks. Uh, this, products, um, uh, this product um, uh, aims to be a social protection for the Romanian population, regardless uh, their economic and social status, uh, but also um, uh, to take up the burden of the state uh, for using public budget uh, for indemnifying the population in case of natural uh, catastrophes. This mandatory system is based uh, actually on a public-private uh, partnership. Uh, according to the law, uh, PAID is accountable for coordinating uh, handling claims process and uh, contracting uh, reinsurance. Uh, while the municipalities uh, have the attributes uh, to check uh, the existence of the policy to the population. The final goal of this law is to have all the Romanian dwellings protected uh, with this insurance. Also, the law is in place since um, 2008, uh, first uh, policy being uh, issued in 2010. Uh, at this stage, uh, we have only 20% uh, of the dwellings uh, uh, insured. 
currently, there are in Romania a total number of 9.3 million dwellings, out of which uh, only 1.8 um, are insured. 1.8 million. Yeah. Uh, that means uh, that four dwellings out of five are not yet insured. There are various explanations uh, why achieving uh, uh, this goal of having a higher protection does not happen yet. A uh, not sat sat satisfactory enforcement of the law, a, a lack of financial education, lack of trust in insurance system, lack of uh, awareness in what regards Romania's exposure um, to catastrophic risks, and so on. As far as uh, by this concerned, um, its, strate uh, its strategy uh, envisage uh, to reach 40% penetration in a medium term. Um, consequently, uh, we have undertaken a, a development uh, plan containing measures that depends on us and uh, allocated for these important uh, resources in order to achieve uh, uh, this goal. So there are still uh, things to, to do, a lot of them. <laughs> we need to improve. Uh, in terms of earthquake, okay, I've seen four out of 10 are, uh, of the dwellings are not insured. But in terms of other risks, because the earthquake is not the, the only significant risk in Turkey. Flooding, I saw there were uh, severe episodes last years. Uh, these are left to the to the voluntary insurance. Yes, actually, uh, TCIP policies are totally separate, and uh, the it goes to the pool. When it comes to the normal, ordinary insurance policies, household policies, uh, actually the penetration is good. I did not check the figures. It's not bad. Uh, it might be even at the same level, uh, uh, around 50% maybe. Maybe for another conference I can check. Because when the first we started with TCIP, everybody said that we should put this uh, compulsory cover in the original household policies. So that all the agencies, when they will, they will sell household policy, immediately they will also sell TCIP. But at the beginning, uh, 20 years ago, the decision was to keep them separate. And we were reacting to it because, including myself, uh, because we said that it will take too much time. On top of it, the commission was very low, less than 10% or maybe 10%. Right now, uh, I'm not sure, but it wasn't more than 10%. And uh, you can imagine for an agent, it's not easy to sell the household policy, first of all. And then, uh, but they were taking 25% commission. And next to it, there is another policy, which is with 10% commission. Agents, they were reluctant to deal with it. Yes, they were saying it once, but then they were leaving it aside and they were selling the household policy. But in the long run, with the tremendous efforts uh, and also with the regulatory uh, checks, which is, so it was obligatory. It was obligatory for people to buy it. And at a state, at the beginning, they were thinking this like a uh, like a tax from the government. They were saying oh, this is a new form of a tax. So this was quite negative at the beginning. But now everybody uh, they learned it, and uh, the ordinary household cover for uh, floods. And also, pl uh, also you should bear in mind that this earthquake cover is only for the households and for the shops at the entrance level of the apartment buildings. So if you have a house, larger house, a villa, or uh, any other uh, office, like a law office, for example, on the third floor, etc., then in that case, you need to have uh, your own household policy as well to, to protect yourself. So people are more knowledgeable than before but still, uh, we could not uh, think that it's not important because religionists uh, 
approach plus the same similar to uh, the Nicoletta, the knowledge level of the general people in the country needs to develop more so that everybody will buy it because for the time being, it's a product that we sell most of the time. Yes, of course, this is known. Uh, Hervé, uh, as far as I understood, in Croatia, about one in 10 uh, households has insurance coverage. Is this valid, this, uh, this percentage valid? It's f also for net cat risks or uh, you are considering household insurance in general? Well, uh, I would say a little bit more. Typically, household insurance uh, holds about 20-25% uh, of the public. However, uh, in buildings containing uh, one or more uh, apartments, uh, basically the policies were not concluded uh, that incorporate uh, earthquake, earthquake risk. They cover only basic fire, uh, flood, <clears throat> hail, and some other perils. However, uh, earthquake risk had to be uh, additionally uh, supplemented and paid. And of course, the, the maintenance uh, companies and the managers of the buildings actually went uh, their own way and did not really offer to the public and to the owners this type of policies for the, at least for the majority of the buildings, specifically, unfortunately, in Zagreb. And this was, uh, this is now a really a very heavy issue because in Zagreb, of course, which is the richest part of Croatia, uh, there is an economic potential for all the, 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 the perils to be insured. However, earthquake was neglected uh, purposely because as I, as I have stated before, uh, our property law says that you have to have an adequate insurance coverage, not really going into detail. We are strongly looking forward uh, to this specific bill regarding uh, the insurance in property, which will demonstrate which risks really had to be taken into uh, account. Uh, unfortunately, Croatian people used to conclude insurance policies only when taking uh, bank loans. And this was actually the good distribution channel for insur insurance uh, products and for the insurance industry, especially before the global financial crisis. In 2008, of course, majority then of the homes were insured, but majority as well without the earthquake coverage. And this is something that we now see a huge gap. And we, of course, do not really see the way forward. I think uh, personal responsibility is, the, uh, is one, but of course the state will have to take care uh, uh, of the current damages and demonstrate in the future how it will tackle uh, of the raising of level of insurance protection in the country. The insurance industry will also uh, demonstrate uh, its ability to really inform the public, to, to put some media and public pressure towards the owner. But of course, I would say uh, personal responsibility and liability at the end is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, pass the mic to Mihaela because she already has some questions from you, from the audience. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, we have a question for Menekshe, but I think it's a question that can be uh, answered by all our panelists. It's a question from Alexandru Chunkan. Uh, Menekshe, thank you for sharing all this information. What uh, was the impact of COVID-19 on the number of dwelling insurance policies? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, actually, I have read it also, but... Uh, can you a little bit uh, broaden for me your question, Alexander? Because maybe I'm misleading. Your question is that what is the impact oh, of yes. COVID-19 on the household insurance? Am I right? Household policies. Uh, you exactly. can see Alexander. Maybe my colleague can put uh, him on the screen. Yeah, I want to see him because I missed him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Manisha. Yeah, th this was my question. What was the impact of the whole COVID-19 uh, situation on the number of household insurance policies? A and I think that uh, the question can be extended uh, if the chair wants to, to all the panelists because it's something that affects us all in all markets. Thank you. Actually, so far, we just have seen the impact of COVID not on the household policies, but on the health policies in Turkey. 
uh, household policies uh, were not having any impact. Maybe I'm missing a point. So I will be uh, curious to hear about other markets. In Turkey, uh, the impact on the motor insurance was the diminishing claims, so increasing profit. On the household, there was nothing because uh, it didn't change anything, but for uh, health, uh, it was uh, an issue to include COVID and most of the insurance companies, they included COVID in their, uh, in their areas and from now on, uh, they have it. And uh, so this was a change. And also regarding the claims again, for the business interruption claims, industrial cover wise, it was also an issue because uh, they, this was a discussion. And I, as far as I know, it's a global discussion, which is having an impact on the larger reinsurers as well. What will happen with the business interruption policies and uh, the claims. Um, so yeah, actually nothing has happened, but if I'm, I'm losing a point, I will be more than happy if someone, maybe I will say, oh yes, but so far I didn't realize. Well, I would say that uh, in Romania, the figures show that uh, the situation, the, the overall situation doesn't differ from the previous years. Uh, while in Croatia, if, if, if I'm not wrong, I think that COVID has a stronger impact on the special situation of uh, reimbursing the claims because of the difficult environment more than on the selling process. Well, I think, yeah, yes. we, we actually went into we actually went into the first lockdown uh, actually on the, the second day uh, the earthquake hit hit us. So we had actually lockdown on Saturday, earthquake on Sunday, and we were expecting Godzilla to attack us on Monday, but it did not really <laughs> occur. So uh, basically what really happened is that really is an insurance industry switched immediately to working online. And, and I would say the, the claims handling solutions were in place and we were really uh, glad to provide a lot, of, a lot of things digitally, especially our public and government sector also immediately switched. All of a sudden, everything could have been done uh, alive, uh, uh, online and, and digitally. So I think it, it sort of gave us a strong push. And in terms of selling process, I would say, uh, Everything can be bought online, the agents and the, uh, everything is equipped. And I think we did not really see any obstacles in, distribu in distribution, apart from the banks. Banks needed to close. And this also hurt the distribution and with the uh, dissipation of bank loans. Uh, and together with the policy policies, we saw some decline. But in terms of uh, our own distribution network and agents, it went all fine. But unfortunately, uh, COVID did not really give a strong push, only the earthquake and the floods and everything. This gives a strong push to, to selling such, such kind of policies. Uh, okay, thank you. I have a question for uh, Mrs. Uh, Radu now, who uh, I think that can also offer the, uh, some details because I know that uh, PAD policies increased a little bit and also household insurance in Romania in 2020. But my question is, Following the local elections from Romania, are the new mayors more willing to apply the law and to sanction the non-insured? Uh, yeah, very good question, Mihaela. Uh, you know that for the first time, um, we have in the government, governmental strategy uh, a goal, a very strategic goal uh, uh, for the, our government to increase the penetration for the mandatory insurance policy. So we are expecting uh, this year to be put in place this uh, new goal of the government. And we are expecting more and more to, to have a, a contribution for the municipalities uh, to, uh, to this uh, uh, strategic goal of increasing the penetration uh, in Romania for, for part. Okay, thank you very much. We also have a question for Voe. Following the earthquake, are in Croatia a discussion regarding a mandatory form of insurance? What is also your opinion on such a solution? Uh, yes, as I have mentioned, yes, there is, there is a discussion about the mandatory insurance, uh, but also there is, a, of course, there is politics on the other side. Uh, 
uh, as as in dominant opinion, uh, any kind of mandatory insurance incurs uh, costs to the owner or to the one who has to have an insurance cover. And of course, the the establishment is always reluctant to to impose additional obligation to the owners. There are, there are always some elections coming up. Uh, finally, we will have elections now in May, and then for three years, I don't see any elections. So we really looking forward and, uh, that in this period, we might really have this bill introduced starting from January 1st next year, mandatory coverage for buildings containing one or, more, or two or more flats uh, in terms that they will also have to have specifically uh, risks insured alongside with uh, uh, earthquake. However, if there will be no sanctions, this will create a problem. And, uh, but this is something which we have to cope with. I, I think any kind of additional regulation uh, will be a, a, a strong message. However, the message we would like to see is that the government or the politician uh, send a strong public message that is take care of your own property. Nobody will do it for you. Uh, take care of it, uh, and that's it. We have to say that in, in Croatia, 85 to 90% of the people own their apartments and houses. We are really keen on owning the property, not really living uh, in rented uh, real estate. So this is something very strong. But on the other hand, we are more than willing to, to buy a Casco policy for the car, but not really reluctant to buy a much more much cheaper policy for the apartment. This is the issue, and we have to uh, make a switch. Uh, usually, I always say that uh, people respond not only in Croatia, but uh, I will limit myself to Croatia. Respond once you hit them on 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 their wallet. Uh, once you hit them in the pocket, once you drag some money out of it, then they will respond. Otherwise, they will very gladly shift all the blame and responsibility to the government and to the state budget. Thank you very much. Uh, another question for my next chair for Mr. Vusala Basov. Uh, what are the main sales channels for TCIP? What is the approximate share of the online sale? Do you use electricity or water network employees to issue policies? Uh, first of all, hello Vusal and my best regards to beautiful Azerbaijan, which I also, uh, I miss very much, yes. And uh, actually, uh, yes, there is online sales, so you can buy your policies online, but the main sales channels are agents. In Turkey, actually main sales channels up to 65% is uh, agents, original insurance agents, professional agents, plus uh, around 10%, 15% are banks. Uh, because when banks are giving some loans, they are also selling these TCIP policies, then it's renewed either by the person, him or herself, or the agent. And uh, some people are buying online as well, but it's rare. Uh, the, uh, the workers in the electricity or water companies, no, they are not selling policies because uh, it's not their right, because the, the right to sell a policy uh, is only given if you are an authorized uh, agent and you need to go to some trainings because now uh, since for maybe seven, eight years, it's obligatory to go through a training to become an insurance person. Uh, even if you want to work in an agent or in a broker, you need to go to take this course. You need to take an exam. Then afterwards, you can work in an agent. So there are some rules. Uh, yeah, that's it. So most of the time, these are agents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we are close to, in fact, we have, we are already uh, exceeded our time, but uh, I still have a question uh, for uh, Mrs. Radu, because I think uh, it is a must, talking also about the reinsurance component, because that cat insurance without reinsurer support, I think it's something that is not possible. And uh, uh, by it, it's considered or has the reputation of being one of the biggest uh, reinsurance buyers in the region for a single uh, contract, single risks. And this is why you have a very close 
relationship with the with the reinsurers and i would like to hear from you if you feel that the reinsurance industry is really supporting insurance in offering uh, solutions more affordable more adapted uh, i don't know improved somehow yeah, um, I like to, to uh, this kind of question because we are proud that we have the biggest reinsurance program in uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, with a capacity of 1 billion euro. Uh, this means that if Romania is hit uh, by an earthquake, uh, such as a March 1977 event, but it has uh, uh, enough capacity to reimburse uh, the policyholders for their damages. Uh, and yes, reinsurance uh, is, is crucial for uh, cat business uh, as it provides underwriting uh, capacity, uh, better understanding and uh, quantification of the cat risks and uh, innovation in products. Uh, the, gap, uh, the gap in cat uh, protection worldwide uh, is big enough to motivate reinsurance market to become even more creative and design uh, products uh, fit for everybody. Uh, all these products and expertise uh, is passed on to the insurance market uh, to be a uh, benefit of both markets and, uh, and the insured. And not least, uh, what I want to underline is uh, that there is no doubt uh, that without reinsurance, uh, cat insurance products uh, would be less affordable and uh, for the public, for the uh, population, and less present uh, as cat business is not working without uh, uh, sufficient uh, diversification. Well then, if you, if you agree that uh, uh, reinsurers are really helping, uh, this is a, of course a good thing. But thank you very much to our panelists. I'm, uh, I'm sorry our time uh, has expired already uh, because there were still some questions for you. Uh, maybe another time uh, with a, a longer uh, panel slot. And uh, at this point, uh, thank you very much to all the three of you. And we will move to our next panel because um, I would like to discuss with uh, my guests about the public perception, the, the way that customers or potential customers uh, see and feel the, the natural catastrophe risks. And uh, to discuss about this, uh, I have invited Mr. Alexandru Chuncan, who is General Director of the uh, Romanian uh, Insurers Association, and Mr. Rafal Mankowski, uh, who's expert within the Polish Chamber of Insurance. Uh, both of them, uh, uh, bo and both the associations, paying very much attention to the risks related to property insurance and to NATCAT in special. So uh, I will start by saying I, I have read some uh, at, at some point uh, a quote that said something like this, natural catastrophes, big events are rare enough uh, or no, are often enough, happen often enough for us to live one each of each of us, but in the, at the same time are rare enough for allowing us to forget them. So uh, uh, have you seen this, uh, I don't know how to, to call it, human reaction towards uh, risks that after uh, a big event, <laughs> after losses, people uh, become more aware and uh, insure, buy more insurance and after that the curve is, again, going down, what would you say? 
let's start with Rafael because you have experienced something uh, very interesting after the 2010 floods, I think, in Poland in this respect. Hello, everybody from Warsaw. Uh, yes, today we have a sunny weather and we don't think about flood. And it is <laughs> to the, the last uh, big flood we had uh, more than 10 years ago. It was 2010. Uh, later, we had a very strong uh, wave of uh, wind. Uh, it was uh, 2017, and this event uh, affected uh, about 20% uh, of uh, in Poland. And uh, I think that uh, to some, in this aspect, we have uh, to some extent a memory of golden fish. Yeah, because uh, in case of this event, we have uh, a lot of information of media. This event, it is always a click bit, uh, click bite, uh, which is uh, heated uh, by uh, all media, particularly social media. Uh, we know everybody that uh, um, emotions, particularly fear, sells very well. But, uh, and uh, um, people are following uh, usually uh, such information, but uh, after um, a few weeks, uh, <clears throat> the people start to focus on another uh, scandals, on another affairs, and uh, um, this interest uh, generally expires very qu quickly. And for example, uh, the last three years, uh, we had in Poland rather the problem of uh, very, Im very important drought. Hydro uh, we have now a complicated hydrological situation and that's why um, uh, for many people uh, the a risk of flood it, it's uh, more theoretic, uh, more something historic, uh, more unlikely. It is something from epoch of climate change. Um, what, is see, what we see now that in the COVID-19 uh, time that the people are uh, concerned about current events and they um, think <coughs> rather about health problems than uh, about catnut problems. Yes, they are closer at this moment. Alexandru, would you agree? Are Romanian op too optimistic to consider seriously <laughs> not cat insurance? Yeah, well, thank you for that. And uh, congratulations for, for organizing this conference. I think it has been uh, quite interesting to, to listen to, to our colleagues from basically all over the world so far. I counted the number of countries present here in the meeting. So it's, it's a great opportunity for us to exchange expertise. Going back to your question, I, I, I heard uh, my colleague Hrve from, from Croatia previously. And if I, if I look to your question, I think that uh, his presentation basically answers it all. I mean, if you see the, the response that, uh, that clients had after the, the two earthquakes that hit Croatia in 2020, I think this answers your question. I mean, basically, if my understanding is correct, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if my understanding is correct, the, um, the coverage, the dwellings insurance coverage in Croatia uh, almost doubled from a year earlier after these earthquakes. And at the end of the day, I guess this is a nat natural reaction that, uh, that we all as humans uh, have. So we shouldn't probably try to change how we react. We should try as industry, we should try uh, our best to, to educate people in the in the positive way of course we should do our best in order to to be able to to inform them better uh, by explaining what are the products and the tools at their disposal in order to to protect themselves i guess this is our mission if i look at risks yeah, uh, yeah please well uh, uh it's a fact that the these big croatian earthquakes came after a period of almost 190 years since the last big earthquake. So I don't know for how long their effect will, will uh, uh, survive now in terms of awareness and, uh, and uh, concern. But going a little bit beside NatCat, uh, I know both of your association have uh, performed sort, uh, some uh, sort of surveys 
trying to understand what are the risks that are the most important for the homeowners? Uh, how do they really see uh, the issue of protecting their homes through insurance? Where, where is the, the main concern when we go to the, the, on the public side? Alexandru, do you have, uh, I think you have some uh, fresh data. Yeah, we, we, we conduct regular, I mean, annual perception studies, which are more or less social, sociological studies, um, because we want to, to have a proper X-ray of what the consumer needs and expectations are, I mean, are in terms of household insurances. And the, the last one took place in October 2020. And of course, uh, this October, we will be conducting our third annual survey. And I can tell you that uh, basically 59% of Romanians are concerned about fires, uh, while earthquake uh, sits on the second position with 54%. And uh, severe weather is the, the third risk that concern them. We do this annually and we make uh, the results public because, and they are picked up by the media. So thank you for that. Um, because we, we want people to, to be aware of, uh, of their surroundings at the end of the day. Besides that, of course, we do, and I, I know that you do, and some other important stakeholders do. I think Paid uh, invests quite a lot in this. We do educational campaigns. So we try our best in order to, to inform the public uh, regarding the solutions that they had. And so far, the data looks good. I know this, this, this is a, a perception study. Yeah, so we basically, we tell what we intend to do, not what we actually do, but still perception is good. So the results of our perception studies show that 74% um, of uh, all participants in October, 2020 uh, were interested and very interested in uh, closing, in buying a, a home insurance policy in comparison with uh, 71% in 2019. I mean, we can see increases in the perception towards uh, household insurance. And also because you discussed it previously, there were a number of, um, of increases at the end of 2020 in terms of gross return premiums, even though they are, they are marginal. I mean, it, this is not 10% or 20%, but still the market is moving, but of course not, uh, not to the pace that we would uh, all have wanted. But it, it's a longer discussion here, you know it, with the mandatory household insurance law that we have set up in Romania and so on and so forth. So looking forward to, to adjusting this law in order to be able to, to increase the, the insurance penetration. Rafael, in Poland, is uh, uh, the same the discrepancy between the, the perception and the actual action of buying insurance? To some, or, to, to some extent, yes. Uh, mm, the penetration of house insurances is about, uh, in Poland, about 60%. Uh, it is quite high in comparison to other, to other countries. And uh, we, uh, conducted, uh, we conducted two polls. Uh, the first, uh, 2018, um, and uh, we interviewed uh, 2,000 respondents from the areas uh, in the, exposed to the risk of flood and strong wind. And 80% uh, um, of respondents said that uh, they don't have enough savings, enough money to uh, buy or uh, re um, rebuild uh, their house in case of damage. Uh, apart from it, uh, um, they are um, in aware of, uh, of the risk uh, about uh, 80 persons said that generally people should be insured. Uh, more than 60 percent uh, respondents disagree with the uh, sentence that insurance premium is uh, too high, that it is important. But uh, the behavior of people is uh, a bit inconsistent because barely uh, 50 percent in case of damage which notify um, uh, their insurers. Um, from other side, more than 50% uh, which 
ask um, local community or government for financial uh, help or uh, which ask uh, their friends or family for financial help. That means that they consider that generally we are as a society um, <clears throat> exposed to the risk. Uh, they think that generally the people should have insurance, but uh, when we are talking about their personal uh, situation, they consider a bit in different way. They, they consider uh, 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 their private situation much better than the general situation. They think that they are safe and uh, the danger is, is somewhere around, not in my home. It is a uh, uh, <clears throat> psychological uh, phenomenon when we are talking about risk perception, that we consider that danger more general, not, but not in our private situation. Well, that leads me to my uh, last question, unfortunately, looking to the watch uh, mm -hmm. for you. Uh, what about the, risks perception, the risk perception versus action in what the public authorities are concerned? Do you think that there is enough attention uh, granted to this topic uh, because in fact all these big events that we have experienced as countries if they would return today after a decade or more since the moment uh, uh, they were occurred uh, would produce much much larger losses because the value of assets has increased. There are more buildings, more valuable content, more industries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at political level, I think in the administrative, public administration level, should consider these things and grant them enough attention. Is this a fact, or it's more like a wish? Mm. Well, which of the would you start? Maybe let's tell us how is it in Poland? Is the Polish are okay. the Polish authorities concerned enough? Um, I'm not sure that enough, but I think that the situation is uh, better than it was a lot of years ago. Uh, of course, as a country, are rising a lot of investments in uh, flat infrastructure. Uh, mm, uh, we are in contact with our government security center, which uh, is launching into our law uh, the protocol of Sendai. And that's why I think that our administration is uh, uh, aware of the risk. But what I want to say that uh, the politicians generally are also a part of society. And I agree with Alexander that the very important thing is education. Because in aspect of that, I think that we have to consider to us uh, two things. First, prevention, and the second, uh, financial preparation for an event. Uh, Samantha uh, <coughs> told a lot of uh, it uh, at the beginning of uh, our conference. And um, in these two aspects, many people do a lot of decisions because we have planning policy, we have preparing of uh, uh, flood, ma flood maps, we, uh, we are talking about uh, purchasing of insurances, we, ha we are talking about investment in, in uh, infrastructure. Uh, it is a lot of decisions and in these decisions are uh, uh, involved local cler clerks, um, entrepreneurs, also individuals, because for example, if we buy a house, we decide where we buy, in safe area or in the endangered area. That's why I think that uh, we, uh, what I want to enhance, that uh, we as a whole society are responsible for our safety, not only politicians. It is my, it is my opinion. Right. In fact, we have a question for, from the audience, which uh, I would uh, add for Alexandru, because it's referring to UNSAR, uh, and this uh, like this goes like this: How is UNSAR collaborating with the authorities regarding the increasing the household insurance penetration? So, how yeah, well, cooperative are authorities? <laughs> first of all, 
I think they're doing our best, but uh, if, you, if you allow me, I will go back to your uh, previous question. Um, I think that the, 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 the public authorities and the state, they're doing uh, their best in this situation, but I will not focus on that. I would also, I would especially like to, to highlight what NGOs are doing nowadays. Uh, we see it in, in Romania, there is a number of NGOs, so non-governmental organizations that started to develop different, different uh, civic programs. Uh, they started to develop apps that can be used in disaster preparedness, in risk prevention connected to uh, to household insurances, and this is something that uh, that I think we would like to to see even more in the in the future, and that we would of course, as an industry, support. Also, I think that over the years we have seen a number of World Bank based uh, or World Bank supported projects, together with our Ministry of uh, Inter Internal Affairs and with other uh, stakeholders, that have uh, produced good results at the end of the day. So I think it's. The, the point here is that we shouldn't probably uh, leave the states to, to, to be alone in this process, but we, we should probably all together, uh, hand in hand, try to, to raise awareness, to help people become and be more prepared in, in front of disasters and so on and so forth. So as, uh, as Rafael was saying, uh, we are all in this together at the end of the day. Regarding your question, um, our cooperation with stakeholders, we are in, engaged uh, together with FAID and with our members uh, on all different levels. We are connecting with and uh, uh, speaking, talking to, to our government, to our parliament. We are waiting to, to see the, the text, the draft of the uh, amended household, mandatory household insurance law, all of us. And we are prepared together with our members and with FAID especially to, to prepare to to support the, the amendment of this piece of legislation in order to, to be able to provide better coverage for for uh, Romanian uh, house owners yeah so I think this this answers it and needless to say we are uh, more than than open to, to any proposal that might came in in this direction thank, thank you, you. Uh, finally. Yes, I know it's late, but uh, still we have one more question for Rafal. Uh, it's coming from uh, Chloe Wood and she is asking, um, what about the SME sector? Uh, are small businesses insured? Mm -hmm. uh, mm, I, okay. I, I don't have data regarding the uh, penetration rates, but uh, what I can I say? Overall, but, the approximation. Uh, approximation, I think it's about uh, 50, 60 percent of MSP are insured. And uh, regarding the value of the portfolios of insurance businesses is almost the same like uh, uh, house insurances. It is a quite important uh, line of business for insurance business. Well, it's a step forward anyway. Uh, it is clear that, uh, as uh, I said uh, previously, we, we, we can't afford to get tired of discussing about these things because there is still a long way mm -hmm. uh, to go ahead to a better situation. Uh, that being said, thank you very much, Rafael and Alexandru. Thank you very uh, it was much a pleasure time. having you here. And, and thank uh, you for the invitation. Oh, always with a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Daniela. I, Thank you also. Mihaela, I think uh, you have uh, some good news from uh, for our guests. Yes. Do you? <laughs> yes, after all this uh, very intense uh, two panels and presentation, we all deserve a short break and a cup of coffee. So see you all in uh, five minutes. Uh, we are coming back with two very interesting presentations and then discussion panel. So a short break.
Let's keep this camera on your own. Hello once again. Hope you uh, feel uh, refreshed. You had the time to to drink a, a little coffee, and you are prepared for uh, our next presentations. Uh, first of, it, of them, it's coming from uh, uh, RMS, from Laurent Maresco. Uh, he's Senior Director for Markets and Products Expert in uh, EMEA. And uh, the good news coming from RMS this, is that they have new solutions to manage natural catastrophe risk in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, RMS uh, has... Uh, organized recently a very interesting webinar on this topic and it will be a second one. Maybe Laurent will tell us more so that you can attend it and find the in-depth information on this topic. Laurent, the uh, floor is yours, please. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you for uh, inviting me for this, uh, for this session today. Um, I hope you can hear me and see me well. I will try to share my screen. Now, let me just do that. Oops. Hopefully you can see my presentation. Let me know otherwise. So, so yeah, th thanks for the invitation. And uh, well, I, I will try to give you this kind of quick overview about the next, uh, let's see, 20 minutes. I will, uh, I will try to be a bit shorter, Daniela, to, to, to keep up with the time. <laughs> um, so um, it's uh, really about the, the new solutions to manage natural catastrophe uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in Europe, in the region in general. Um, as you said, I think we, we have seen already today that there are many different perils that uh, affect the, the, the eastern region and the southeastern region and the, the, of Europe. And uh, quake has been really one of the key topics we discussed quite in, in large already. Uh, we have been also all this uh, influence on, on the flood risks. And uh, uh, we also have touched uh, really well on, on all the challenges, the ongoing challenges. We have been talking about for years now around uh, really the, 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 the protection gap, right? Uh, especially when it comes to this kind of periods. So uh, in my presentation, I would like to give a bit more uh, a modeling perspective about um, two different uh, aspects of where RMS uh, as a specific position of as an external model vendor is trying to help uh, in Europe and especially in, in, in this region. Uh, and I would like maybe to try to address really uh, the, the perspective of the primary insurance company because this is where uh, a lot of the, 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 the things start, right? This is really the, the vehicle to, 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 to bring this protection uh, to, to, the, to the different customers in those countries. And um, here uh, we have basically two challenges. It's basically, I would say how to provide business with more confidence, especially uh, when it comes to retail or small residential business. How can we help uh, to bring more analytics uh, at the point of the writing, which is really one of the key elements um, uh, of, this, uh, of this challenge. And the second one I would say is more about how to manage the challenge tomorrow. I know that the topic of uh, the, the, the moving landscape or the risk of climate change is, is a topic. So I will try to address a little bit how we can address that now with those modeling solutions and what is possible uh, to do today. Um, to give you just a perspective about our strategy in uh, developing products and models, I just want to show you where we are today in terms of covering the, the, the Europe as a region. So forget the individual peril. We have all this earthquake, this windstorm. We just have now this new hail, a civic electric storm model in Europe. And uh, we have, of course, the, those flood models as well there. Um, but what's important on the map is what is really in dark blue. This is where we are currently with having fully probabilistic solution uh, for one or more of those different periods, meaning really the full model that is really complex things. And you see there is still the light blue part where we are not there yet. We are progressing, but not there yet. There is a lot of challenge. Uh, and so in my presentation, I just want to, to show you, of course, the solutions we have today in some of those countries, the dark blue and the probabilistic model, when you can ex extract you know, the, the full PML analytics and so on. And also what is the available uh, today, I would say, to manage the risk uh, in, in, other, uh, in other regions. So it's important to understand that we uh, creating a probabilistic model on, from our perspective is pretty complex because it's not only creating the science behind the model, it's actually also delivering that to the market. 
we have this kind of uh, uh, responsibility of making it in, in the right way, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, product stability, service, and so on, so that really insurance company can really productize that. So it's not really having a solution that you can use for research work or some very uh, specific purposes or internal use. It's really something, it's real product. So this is why we, we go uh, really in, in this progression, step by step, I would say, uh, in, uh, in covering the different territories and periods. And uh, do, doing those models is very complex, as you will see uh, later also in my presentation, we, we have this complex modeling uh, uh, structure. And I think here, uh, I will just take the, the European flood model as an example, because it's a very nice example about the complexity of modeling such peril. Um, uh, but there are many aspects of a complex modeling flood in a proper way, I would say. The first is probably the capturing the correlation correctly, you know. Having models working country by country doesn't work because you miss this kind of correlation between the countries or between the different regions. So we need to have a, a, one unique model to capture that. You can see uh, it can be significant uh, in, between those, for example, in Czech Republic and Germany at 200 year uh, written period. 20% of the difference in, 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 in the loss could be due just to this correlation. So um, capturing correlation is very important. It means we need to create massive model uh, that cover the continent and that creates a unique challenge on a technical perspective. But you see, we can and then start to have really interesting pictures. What you can see on the screen is the correlation of Vienna with the rest of Europe. You see the dark blue is highly correlated uh, places from the flood risk perspective. Uh, and you see, of course, the, the correlation through the river system, to the hydrology, but what is so important is also to understand the correlation through the meteorology, basically through the precipitation. And it's another challenge when you model floods, you don't start modeling floods in the river system, you need to model floods starting with precipitation, because we know that's 40 to 60 percent of the, of the claims actually in Europe happens outside from the major flood plain. So it's it's examples of challenge when you create those models that we need to, to, to deal and tackle to have a proper model that give confidence to the insurance industry. And this explains this complexity in modeling things and, de and delivering the products. Now, from the insurance perspective, those models, I would say they have been used a lot about the range for the range insurance use case. Uh, now, I would like to address the perspective of the primary insurance rate willing to increase basically the market share or the coverage in some regions. How can they use some analytics? And here it's interesting to understand, to leverage the different usage we can see on the market globally, I would say that it's valid in Europe as well. You see, um, on the modeling side, these full models are probably much used uh, in terms of underwriting large commercial industrial specialty risk where you have time to model the risk and the premium volume, the, the price, the, allow that it's cost effective to spend time doing a proper modeling. But when it comes to smaller exposures, so such as residential, small commercial, middle market, usually we use tariff and here uh, it's difficult to use the model. It's not cost effective. We need to have a uh, very cheap solution that are high volume and, and very speedy, possibly automated process to underwrite uh, the risk and modeling, cap modeling as itself is not uh, an appropriate tool. So at RMS, what we have been doing over for the past two years is a bit like a shift of using, I would say, those models to bring more uh, information uh, at the point of underwriting to help uh, insurance company create more, create more informed zoning system, for example, mixing hazard information. You see, for example, flood zone depth with banded loss cost for different type of periods and being able to classify the risks in terms of tarification. But also, so the model can help inform that structure, this tarification. But of course, now is how to bring real-time uh, uh, submission into this framework. And this is where this... Um, change we have been doing now uh, in, in, in the way we deliver this modeling in, um, information uh, has happened. Basically, we have taken those big models we use traditionally for range and capital uh, management to turn that into a solution that could be consumed in primary underwriting, such as hazard maps or this pre-compiled loss cost that we'll talk in a minute, to quantify the risk at the, the, the single risk level. And what is important to understand is done in a consistent way with the model. It means that when an insurance company is using this underwriting solution, what is interesting is that actually they uh, underwrite new risk, they add new risk in the book of business in, uh, in, 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 uh, in a consistent way with the way the, the 
portfolio is managed. So the portfolio strategy is aligned with the underwriting strategy from that perspective. You don't create bias or deco decoupling as if you use different solutions or different uh, approach to, to do the, the, the different aspects of the, of the business. So let's have a look. Uh, I've, I've taken here an example uh, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw where uh, we have take, I've taken three locations, uh, this a bit randomly uh, in the city, one is a bit outside the uh, question two. And uh, so how, how this could look like basically uh, when you use those data. Um, first, the first question you may ask is, uh, should, should, should you worry that that risk, what is the risk level? So if you take those three addresses, basically, traditionally, you can use your own or harvest or whatever the job coding process to locate that on, on the hazard data uh, maps and extract this information. And it's interesting uh, because you can get, I would say, this hazard blended information. And also, it's not only, I would say, hazard, um, uh, I would say, um, risk zones, right? Where it shows that medium, high or low risk. It's really with the... The, 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 the flood flood information in it, right? The severity banks is very important because it gives you also this quantitative aspect of the flooding. So beyond this specific use case, just look at three different examples how this could look like. Um, uh, for two different return periods, 100 year, 500 year, it's interesting to see how you could use that in your risk selection. And you see between, between those two locations actually, uh, the risk is actually pretty different, right? You see for the location one, uh, we have actually almost no risk uh, up to very high written period of flooding, while the location two is pretty much more risky. You get already uh, half a meter of flooding at the 100 year. So that's an example of how those, uh, uh, you know, uh, assets creating from um, cat, probably cat model can be used into risk screening and risk understanding at the location level. You could even think about uh, creating stress tests, for example, by simulating uh, the fact that all flood defenses will fail as a worst case scenario, and you see that different parts of the city react differently uh, to the flooding. So that's a, 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 an example, but the model can actually allow to go a step further, which is probably the most interesting part, is to quantify how much you should charge for those locations without having to run the model. So what's uh, we are in the process, we, we have done here actually is to pre-compile all the different positions you may find in Europe or where, where we have model, like in, like in Poland, for example, for a selection of different type of buildings for flood, earthquake, hail, wind and tornado. And those loss costs, actually, they are just here to uh, be able to provide you as well uh, a, a real uh, time of in an instant estimates the technical premium you can you can use to estimate what is the fair price i would say risk based pricing at this location level you see uh, of course uh, on floods this is where the, the most of the great the gradient happen right you see the location 3 well, almost no risk to be paid uh, basically no the premium of zero while the location 3 is very much at risk and um, it, it's really interesting because it's it allows you to to have as an insurance company a very quick and a bit of more confidence in terms of uh, the adequate pricing you need to charge. You can uh, use this information to mutualize the risk to make sure that at any kind of uh, geographical level, uh, the risk is actually shared in a proper way. Uh, and of course, grow this book a bit more with confidence because you know what you're pricing. And most importantly, I would say you are able to relate uh, that information in more advanced tarification. Uh, that you may uh, you will be able to establish. So that one, it's one first illustration, of course, of what uh, we can do where we um, where we have a model to bring more analytics, quantified analytics. The quantification is important at the point of the writing for the insurance company. Now the question is where we don't have a model. Uh, this is more complex because we don't have we cannot extract that. So. Uh, we have been doing some research recently, and we are just now uh, in the process of progressively releasing those uh, those uh, those data by, by using, for example, machine learning uh, to uh, create uh, data layers where we don't have a model. Basically, we have a big model, probabilistic model for the US, for Europe, for the countries like Japan, and so on. And the idea is basically to train algorithm on those models in terms of generating floodings. And you, what you can see on the map is actually the the, the some kind of blind test of the Philadelphia 100-year flood maps 
the hydrodynamic, the real model on the top, and you can see at the bottom the machine learning the equivalent. It's pretty close, right? It's not all features, of course, we've reflected, but the main features are there. So the idea now is to export that to other places uh, where we don't have a model. So just an example, hopefully you can see on the screen, it's a bit light, but that's an example of Bucharest and Romania, where we let that model run. You see, we, we capture, of course, the big river system, you, you could ask the Danube uh, to, the, to, the, to the south, but you see all this kind of more uh, medium and medium, medium minor river system that could affect there. And uh, I, I found also very interesting, uh, I just lost the, 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 those pictures for, for that, because it, it's just to see different type of hydrodynamics between different places, like Sofia in Bulgaria and Belgrade in Serbia, you see uh, the influence, of course, of the big stream river system. It's an undefended view, so it's a view where all the flood events have, have failed. But th that's where we go now in, the, you know, devoting more information uh, for insurance company um, while uh, we are building the full model for the future. We can already start to deliver something of a value for the insurance industry. And of course, the idea now is to add on top of that some, some damage information and so on to be able to run some deterministic accumulation, it be, being able to quantify the risk in, 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 a, in a more realistic way uh, globally from that perspective. Now, just to, just watching the time to the interest of time, okay, um, in terms of using those models, I think what we are also trying to, to do in, is not only to offer, to, to bring more analytics to the insurance industry, right, uh, um, but for managing the risk today, but it's also to help uh, manage the, the risk tomorrow, the future of the resilience. And back to my point about flood modeling, uh, it's, as I said, modeling flood is probably one of the most complex model we have in that cat. We need to model, uh, I like to say that the full story of, uh, of a drop of water from, from the clouds down to the basement of a building where it would damage some goods. So that's a full story, the full physical, flood modeling needs to happen we need to start with modeling precipitation you know and then the, the rainfall runoff about the topography the, the the routing in the river system how this interact with the events and probably I mean inundation where you can generate some losses and so we can basically use those tools as well to do some additional research especially around climate change so one of the the, the most recent uh, elements we have been doing over the past few weeks and months, and we just released now some, some new functionalities around that to the market and, 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 and papers you can read, is about, of course, maybe uh, replicating some climate change scenario in the, in, in the models. So we know, for example, uh, that in, in the future, there is uh, some, some certainty that we will head for more extreme, even extreme drought, extreme flooding. So we can basically tune the model, you know, uh, create a specific model reflecting some of those scenarios and see how this transfer into losses. And one of the main message, which is very important is that it's a nonlinear process, you know, uh, between a change in the hazard and a change in the loss, all the loss process generation is a nonlinear process. The, the flood defense uh, behavior is nonlinear. The vulnerability functions are not linear. So uh, the CAD model is probably one of the best tool to uh, show you as an insurance industry the, the, the this long the, the, this non-linearity basically right basically that that could lead to big uh, a small change in hazard could be to lead to big loss uh, quantify big loss in in your in, in your for your business and uh, maybe another act, uh, so if you are interested we just have like a, like a free access of white papers on that we just use that as an example but we're developing more scenarios on that but it's interesting, I just extracted a little bit the picture for an RPC 4.5 scenario for the 2050 horizon. It's pretty far away, but it gives you a little bit how those different countries could uh, react to, to some changes in, uh, in the flood risk landscape. Uh, you see typically uh, in, uh, in the Eastern region, I think that's the, I mean, about 40 to 60% actually of the AL could be, could be increased uh, due to this phenomenon. And maybe my last point that maybe we can discuss a bit. Well, just a slide to, to show you there is resource you can you can you can see if you are interested. We we do that we, we do that also for windstorm, which may be probably relevant. We, we discussed briefly before that about Poland and the, and the wind. That's some countries maybe find that also very interesting. 
but another aspect of the research, uh, uh, I just want to highlight, it. probably we have time to discuss, uh, I'm happy to discuss about that on the panel, is about how we can also use those models to not only show the worst that would happen due to change in the climate, um, but also how our society could react to that. And uh, the, 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 having a complex uh, flood model, such the, the, the one we have here, allow us to do things such as adjusting the flood defense information. For example, we can mimic some scenarios around the standard of protection around the river system. We can even, uh, uh, you know, mimic some scenarios or re replicate some scenarios about the flood protection at individual risk level and understand how this would decrease the risk level. What is the adaptation, the, 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 basically the, the physical um, uh, re resilience uh, impact on the insurance industry? And uh, a few years ago, we, we published that, now a couple of years ago now, uh, about the Flodry, you're using that. So everybody knows Flodry, I think, in the UK. And it, it, they just went with a very interesting study uh, quantifying for uh, all the public authorities, I would say, what is the benefit in investing in flood protection? And they basically run the, 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 the defended today AL, which is 100 million to what it happens if there is no investment in flood defense. It's a, it's a bit an extreme case, but you understand, we can quantify, you can articulate basically um, um, the, the benefits of, of investing in, in, flood, uh, in flood protection. Uh, and basically, I would say, empower a discussion from the insurance industry back to the public authorities, basically to, to link back the financial resilience with uh, the physical resilience and show uh, how together it, they could work, create scenarios, it, it invest, it investigate, for example, uh, what is the best place uh, to mitigate the risk uh, in conjunction to the financial mitigation and so on and so forth. So you see there is a, a whole uh, um, uh, wealth of, of, of different possibilities that is, um, that, that, that is empowered by those models for what we call this resident analytics uh, um, feedback. So I, I hope I, I managed the time uh, without rushing too much, Daniela, but I just wanted basically as, to give you just a few insights, right? I think the, the, the first is, of course, to see that we try to help insurance company. We are no longer, we are not definitely not a rate insurance uh, solution or basically modeling provider. We try also to bring this analytics to uh, something that is useful for the primary uh, underwriting process as well. And, uh, and trying also not to, as, as quick as we can complete some geographical play uh, uh, coverage, even if we don't, can wait to have like the full probabilistic model in place. Uh, and uh, also the, the, I think the challenge tomorrow, it was my, my second point. I think that those models, they can help also to better understand how we can, um, uh, we can be prepared for the future. We should envision that. Uh, it's also something we can, I'm happy to discuss that later on, but this climate change scenario, they, they can respond to different questions. It's not only the, two, the, two, the 2050 year projection that maybe is more a regulatory perspective. We can have more five, 10, 15 years perspective as well, which is probably more relevant for the business use case as well and so on. And I realized I, I didn't have time to have a lot of this, uh, of this uh, interaction today. I mean, to, to, to present in the most extent, but, just if you want to, to, to learn more, you're most welcome. I invite you to join us. I think it's two weeks or it's a traditional client conference. I just show that here because uh, uh, this year it's open to everyone. So it's not only for our clients. So if you want to dig into deeper aspect of the topics I just highlight, feel free to register. Uh, it's just open. It's virtual, of course, as you can imagine. Uh, but that's just my own uh, um, you know, follow-up item if you want to learn more on any of that. Thank you. I hope it was not too fast and uh, still interesting, but um, yeah, happy to take the questions or to discuss at the panel right after that. Thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, in fact, uh, I, we already have a question from you, from Samantha, but uh, my proposition is that uh, because you will be both in the panel coming <laughs> next, <laughs> you can discuss it there. Sure. So uh, we will move to our uh, last presentation today. Uh, which will touch a topic that is uh, a little bit less considered usually, 
uh, namely the use of parametric insurance for covering the financial losses experienced by businesses as a result of natural hazards. Uh, of course, we have talked last year a lot about the uh, business interruption in and financial losses of businesses because of the COVID-19 situation. But uh, uh, look, there is uh, also this uh, context of the of the NATCAT risks, which is uh, uh, another thing. And uh, our presentation comes from Mr. Alina Anastasiu, uh, business development man manager with Renovia uh, Serebea. Uh, it's a Romanian company, brokerage insurance brokerage company, but it's part of a, a regional chain of Renovia. And uh, I think, uh, or I'm sure we will, we will find out something very interesting now. Alin, please. Thank you, Daniela. Good afternoon, everybody. We are actually uh, a Czech company, Renovia, but also we have a global footprint through the partner with um, Gallagher, AJ Gallagher, United States. Uh, now it's my turn to talk about this new kid in town, as Parametric is, is called, because it's trying to, to gain uh, more uh, field in the net cat risk. Uh, indeed, uh, this parametric insurance, it's not very, uh, it's not an usual solution when it, when it comes about covering uh, uh, natural catastrophic uh, risk. But uh, <clears throat> as we all know, we cannot stop nature and prevent storms or earthquake from happening. But we can help to we can help companies to take right decision uh, to protect them and reduce the impacts. We are really in Renomia trying to help communities and uh, businesses tackle uh, climate related risks, and usually we do that by addressing uh, three areas. And I will uh, share my screen now as I speak. Okay, hopefully we can all see my presentation here. I will not go through the facts that have been already uh, presented by uh, previous uh, uh, speakers. So I will move a little bit uh, faster on this. Uh, <clears throat> how we do help communities and businesses uh, we, are, we are doing this by building resilience and uh, protecting in real time and uh, help companies to recover fast from natural disasters. And uh, we usually use integrated vision of the three pillars when it comes about parametrics approach. Anticipate, alert, and response. Uh, these are three stages of the event, before, during, and uh, immediately after. Uh, what does it uh, mean, anticipate? Well, it's about preparing the action uh, process before the event. The alert phase uh, stands for receiving information and recommendations for preventive actions to be taken at the right time before and during the event. And the responsive stage means that we build resilience by quickly adapting from visual assessment right after the natural disaster. Uh, visual assessment like uh, satellites, like drones, and even social media. Uh, <clears throat> parametric uh, approach uh, is uh, using a new, a totally new claim process model. And that make, uh, it makes uh, a story in comparison to, to the traditional approach. Uh, a new claim process model is based on define. You have to choose the uh, parameters. Uh, monitor, to monitor that parameters and independent source will confirm if policy is triggered or not. And get paid. Usually the, the payouts are done very quickly within a few days after the report is uh, shared with the, with the client. It's very simple, very fast, and very transparent. 
Okay. Um, parametric solutions, when it comes about uh, insurance, has multiple addressability. And I will name here the main uh, areas where parametric are really, uh, let's say, uh, an important uh, alternative to traditional approach. Uh, in industry, weather conditions that cause damages and business interruptions like cyclone, earthquake, wildfire, uh, river height, storm, hail and flood. Uh, in energy sector, uh, it's about adverse weather conditions that cause loss of revenues or destroy infrastructure. Uh, in construction area, uh, adverse weather conditions that cause project delays like strong winds, like excess rainfall, extreme temperatures and uh, wave height. And even in agriculture, we can face NATCAT risks. And I will uh, name just a few drought, which is the most, uh, uh, let's say, um, <clears throat> important risk to be covered, especially in some parts of, uh, of Europe and not only, frost, excess rainfall, loss of yield, which is very important, and, uh, and hail. And now I will go quickly through some uh, examples how the parametric can be applied to the NATCAT risk. Actually, uh, I will be talking about uh, more of the financial losses here instead of uh, property uh, losses. Uh, for example, in the energy area, there is a risk which is called mild winter. And I took uh, an example of, uh, of the company of a gas provider, which can be really affected if the winter is not very strong or tough in the sense that the consumption, uh, which is directly correlated to the outside temperatures, can uh, dramatically decrease, and that affects the financial uh, figures of the company. Uh, the company actually is facing losses. We can prevent those kind of losses by addressing this new model, which works on an index, which is called, in this case, uh, the cumulative heating degree day, and a threshold, uh, which will be addressed to this index. And as you can see from the chart on the right, if the threshold <clears throat> is below the index, then uh, the policy is triggered and the payout is, uh, is reached. And that is an example how can uh, a payout can look into uh, in this type of example. Uh, it's very easy to assess and it's very easy to monitor and uh, it helps companies to recover really fast in case of this uh, um, risk. Another case that I'm presenting to you uh, in the same area of energy is the lack of wind cover, which uh, addresses usually for um, <clears throat> uh, wind farms. Uh, it's very well known that uh, the wind farm is uh, fully uh, um, uh, depending on the, the winds. And if the, the speed of wind is below a certain level, uh, then uh, there is a problem with the producing energy. And this model can easily be applied to these wind farms. Uh, and uh, providing the company a full and fast recovery uh, in case of the wind is not very strong. Another example is the lack of rainfall. Uh, I expressed the, this example on a dam. Uh, you can see that uh, from, from the proposed example, if uh, the level, uh, the rainfall level uh, is uh, below a certain threshold, then uh, the production of energy is, uh, is reduced, which leads to a certain financial loss. Well, the parametric solution can, uh, can, uh, can be a very um, reliable and feasible solution to have the, the company being paid out immediately within a few days. Um, in in agriculture, for example, we can also talk about NATCAT risks. And uh, I will jump directly to the drought 
because drought is really uh, a very uh, important and uh, very painful uh, risk that affects also Romania. And we are, uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, companies and farmers that are facing uh, huge losses when it comes about yields. Drought can be addressed uh, both by uh, rainfall or by uh, soil moisture index. The example that you are seeing on the screen now is based on a cumulative rainfall. It's very easy to, to follow, to understand. You see the historical uh, rainfall in the last 20 years. Uh, in this example, it was a threshold set to 150 millimeters uh, <clears throat> water. Uh, and uh, you see the, in, in some specific years, for example, 2018, uh, there is a, let's say, a, a less uh, rain that happened, which triggered the insurance. And it was, let's say, uh, an estimated uh, payout to approximately 2.3 million euro in this uh, example. So um, drought uh, can be, in our opinion, in uh, Reynomia's opinion, a very, um, let's say, um, desired risk uh, for, for the parametric uh, insurance uh, because it's much easier to assess the loss and it, it's much better for the client to, to recover. Uh, the recovery is very, very fast. And uh, <clears throat> I would say that um, There are not necessarily uh, too many information in order for the client to, to get some, some quotations. First, we need to understand from the client what uh, exactly he wants, because parametric is very flexible insurance. Uh, it can provide uh, low deviation from, uh, from climatology, for example, or severe deviation. Severe deviation uh, triggers uh, a much uh, lower premium uh, but the recurrency of the, of the event is, uh, for example, one at 10 years, which is uh, more relaxing in terms of budget uh, for the client. Also, if the client uh, has some money to spend on insurance and good solutions for, uh, for this, uh, it can apply to, to a more standard deviation from climatology, like 10% or 15%, which implies a bigger insured premium. So uh, it's very important that the client uh, uh, decides what, what kind of, of event he wants to insure. And I would give you another example, um, which was not presented into my presentation uh, regarding the uh, tourism uh, area. For example, a hotel, which is uh, close to a river or uh, to a mountain or whatever. Um, but if it's a seismic uh, area, and if it happens that uh, from time to time there is an earthquake there, uh, the, the company which uh, owns the hotel can uh, access this solution in order to, to cover the, let's say, uh, how, how many rooms are occupied uh, during a specific period. And if the earthquake uh, happens, of course, uh, some tourists may uh, reconsider their choices to come there and to spend their uh, holidays there, which triggers some losses to the company. And um, it's very simple to, for the client to, to take these uh, solutions because uh, what uh, the client needs to do is to inform the, the insurer what would be the, the degree of the earthquake uh, when the policy is triggered. And uh, <clears throat> to inform the insurer if the event uh, happened. It's very easy. Uh, it, it's really very, very simple uh, process. The loss uh, claims adjustment is extremely uh, uh, reduced. And within a few days, uh, the company is being paid for the losses uh, it uh, faced. So that would be in a few words about uh, the parametric approach uh, on, uh, on this uh, net cat risk. 
Of course, uh, the mission in, uh, in our company is to, uh, to provide clients with uh, innovative and concrete solutions to cover all their climate uh, protection needs now and tomorrow. Well, it seems uh, very simple. I'm sure in, in backwards, it's a lot of work and a very complex uh, process. But uh, if it's simple for the clients, then uh, this is uh, what they really need. Uh, I think Mihaela has a question for you. Yes, it's a question from uh, Mrs. Menekshe Ucharolu from Turkey, uh, which uh, who asks you if you issue any policies if yes, in which countries, and if you have a model in place for Turkey? Uh, yes, we have issued policies in Romania. We are doing this for three years now. Um, <clears throat> I do not have any information about the Turkey market. I know that earthquake is a major uh, challenge there. Um, but the partners that we are uh, collaborating with uh, on the parametric insurance, they, uh, they are uh, global companies like uh, AXA, like Generali, like Tokyo Marine. And um, for sure, they have solutions also in the, in the Turkish market. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. With this, uh, the uh, presentations we had prepared for today uh, are over and uh, we are going uh, uh, to the last panel of the day uh, for which I am uh, inviting Laurent to remain together with us. I am inviting Samantha to come back <laughs> together with us and also uh, we will have uh, Mr. Gheorghe Grad, uh, CEO of Renomia Serbia Romania. Uh, if I can see them all three, uh, I will start uh, with a question that uh, goes for uh, Laurent and Samantha. Uh, namely, uh, you, you have talked, Laurent, very much about uh, new solutions that are available so that insurance in the sea may offer better net cat uh, protection. But once these solutions are in place, from a scientific point of view, let's say, what would be needed in terms of policy, education, etc., so, so that in the end, the result would be the, a reducing, an actual reducing of the protection gap? Because I think not only technology, it's, it's enough. From your experience, what would be the main thing that would be needed? Yeah, that's yeah, I think it's a very good point. I think I, I can give you the okay the, the modeler perspective, but it's clear, it's clear that uh, okay. Uh, to be clear, my presentation about analytics and cat modeling, uh, cat models are probably uh, uh, some necessary tool to bridge the protection gap, but they are not the sufficient one, right? You you need to quantify the risk. You need to manage the risk. If you cannot quantify it, it's difficult to manage at the price and so on. So we need, as you said, uh, Daniela, probably education. We need to reach out not only to the, to the I mean, we have seen there are many efforts to, to reach the policy orders to make them aware of that. But I would say on, on the modeling side, also the education of the, of the industry about, especially when we use these new analytics in processes, how to use them, how to not misuse them. Uh, the, the worst that could happen could be to uh, make them have bad experience using that new technology. And then they will say, okay, no, no, no way. I, I want just to get rid of that. And I, I'm back to my, to my previous uh, approach, um, with me, which may be such suboptimal. So, so that's also a lot about, uh, about education. Uh, I, I truly believe also the, uh, the importance of the public uh, private partnership and this, um, and maybe I read your excellent question, Samantha, on the on the on the nature-based uh, approach. It's, it's one example, you know, the fact that, I mean, the insurance industry. We, we have to realize we own a lot of knowledge, and uh, we are not here just passively covering what is the the. the what remains of the risk when everything failed? Just finance that. No, we can't. We, we can't give that element back. 
And um, so this flood protection element is an important one. Just to give you this example about natural based, uh, I, I will try to find a link and share in the, in the, in the, in the, in the chat, but we had, we, we published a couple of years ago, a research paper together with the, um, it was together with the University of Santa Cruz and uh, it, it's just an example. And, um, and the, the Nature Conservancy, uh, it's an organization about the, the, the impact of maintaining the mangroves in Florida to protect against storm surge and flooding. And we noticed that if they will lose that mangroves around the coast, the, the average annual flood damage would increase by 20% in most of the counties. So you see, you can basically mimic these scenarios, quantify the risk and make people realize that you need to uh, mitigate the risk. It's not only hot mitigation, but you know, the, the protection of our vegetation is probably also a good element. So all, the, all this communication should happen, right? It's not just the technology, it's what you do with that, basically. What would you say, Samantha? <laughs> From your experience, what is besides technology and uh, pure science in uh, dealing with this protection gap? Um, so, first and foremost, fully agree with what um, Laurent was saying about the use of, of cat models and being able to explore them um, for perhaps more, more ambitious projects is the way in which I would, I would frame it. But ultimately, I think there are three key things um, to work on. The first is really risk communication. Cat risk models, when you work in the insurance industry, um, you're, you're very much speaking with your peers and it's great. However, when we go out and we're speaking to, to our clients at the, the bank, when we're speaking to ministries of finance, we often find that we're um, speaking a completely different language. Um, for example, they don't really understand what a return period is. Um, it's very difficult for them to conceptualize the, the events of different magnitudes. So I think trying to find some, some common ground as to how you communicate this risk is, is absolutely key. Um, the second point I would make would be finance. Um, we, we have seen several times over, um, particularly in less developed countries, um, there's gonna be a need for financial support to pay premiums. Um, and, and that is gonna remain and it's gonna remain for, for some time. Um, there is a price that comes with insurance um, and sometimes public subsidization is needed in order for it to become affordable. And, and that is a reality. Donors are now starting to recognize this. It's the, the dialogue has been going on for the past um, about 10 years for this. Um, and so we're now seeing facilities, for example, like the, the global um, risk financing facility that largely provides premium subsidies towards um, these sorts of financial products. Um, and then a third point that I would make would be enforcement. So we've heard, we've heard an awful lot um, today about the, the need for um, governments to, to mandate insurance and how it can be useful. Um, but we've also heard the flip side, great if it's mandated, but how do we actually enforce that? And so doing some thinking about perhaps going up the, the food chain, for example, if you have a, a mortgage embedding the, the NatCat insurance within the mortgage, these types of things are things that we're, we're trying to increasingly explore um, so that um, ultimately it's, it's a cost within the, the mortgage itself, rather than people thinking that they're having to pay something additional on top um, in order to have that financial protection. Um, so we're, we're looking at this from both the household level and also um, in particular for SMEs as well. So those, those would be the three points, risk communication, finance, um, and then the enforcement of your policies. Thank you very much. This is a very clear, so clear summarizing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, we are uh, talking uh, usually at least we here uh, at Exprim, uh, very much about uh, insurance protection related to the housing stock and uh, dwellings and uh, generally what is private property of people, of citizens. But there is a very large segment which is business related. And uh, I would go to Mr. Grad with my following questions. What, how would you comment on the eventual protection gap in, in what 
businesses are concerned. Is it one? I know that usually businesses are better insured than people, but anyway. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, you are right. Indeed, uh, there is a protection gap in the traditional insurance market for uh, corporate facing medcat risks, primarily for mid-sized players or SMEs. Uh, this protection gap is uh, increasing year on year, as we saw, since insurers have uh, lower appetite for uh, the peak risks. We can see example in wildfire you know, or earthquake in California, tropical cyclone in Caribbean, earthquake in Japan. Uh, we can see insurer asking for higher retention, offering lower capacity and increasing premium. These are trends based on increasing of net cat uh, uh, claims ratio. And uh, this is an area where parametrics can step in. Due to it, uh, it's weather related only uh, features because there is no moral hazard since there is no possible human influence on parametrics. Large client can now buy a parametric first layer to bridge the protection gap. Up to now, the tailor-made parametric insurance is only offered by very large insurance reinsurance players like Swiss Re, Munich, AXA, Generali, to top tier clients. SME are set aside due to lack of education on the market on one side, complex distribution channel on the other side. For the last year or last two years, we can see several NGAs like Jumpstart, Meteo Protect, Fluid Flash, Lemonade, Stormpiece. These new NGAs offer very simple with limited possibility to have tailored solution, but they can address the need of the retail plus lower end or the SME segment, given the limited capacity for this flare can offer. So uh, middle size segment has no solution yet, unfortunately. In the short run, probably two to five years, uh, from these MGAs, uh, we are expecting to have a higher uh, capacity to cover and to and the large reinsurers to scale up the service to this segment as well. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, if uh, you allow me, I would uh, emphasize my opinion that not only that the gap is larger on the SME uh, segment, but this kind of businesses are really the most vulnerable to such risks. Uh, the, the pandemics has shown so many small businesses that uh, didn't have coverage or didn't uh, really understood very well what coverage they had in place. And have no financial resources to sustain a crisis situation without insurance. So this is a topic that should uh, capture the attention of, uh, of uh, as many stakeholders as possible. Uh, well, uh, thinking a bit about planning and strategy, I would like to ask you, Lauren, something else. Um, I remember that many years ago when uh, <clears throat> I would... Uh, get in contact for the first time with modeling and risk uh, the risk modeling topic. Uh, when you were talking about it, usually you were thinking right away to underwriting. It was the, the first and direct link. But uh, uh, nowadays, I think that in the environment where um, the regulatory requirements are increasing, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, risk involved, uh, capital requirements and so on and so forth. Models can be also used for strategic decisions and not only for insurers, also for other types of companies, especially those who are global, who are uh, have uh, units all over the world. Is it right? Are they useful or understood and used by other businesses? Yes, of course. I think that's. I mean, we we move outside of that, right? I think this. Uh, I mean, the the, the past comment on the on the risk reduction and is also interacting. I would say a lot with the with the public entities. You mentioned Daniela, the regulatory landscape. I think that's also a, a very. Uh, I mean, we have seen over the past five years it is growing. I think 
at different speeds depending on, on the regions in Europe, I would say, but globally about the um, about in putting, I would say, a bit more uh, a bit more analytics into that. Uh, as an example, we we have been working recently uh, with the, the Italian regulatory authority Ivas, to, to 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 provide metrics for quake risks in Italy. You know, less than five percent of residential building in Italy have insurance for for quake risks. So they were using uh, some some of our analytics to create a report to raise awareness to try to do to to bring this on on the, I would say almost on the political agenda. Um, and uh, I mean, one thing we mentioned that resonates is something we are pretty active is, uh, you mentioned the mortgage, right? It's uh, something that is really uh, uh, also a, diff uh, a new use case for those, uh, for those uh, models and, and, and those analytics. Uh, um, it's clear that there is actually, uh, the research we have seen revealed there is actually a strong correlation between the uh, negative equity and, and that that could impact basically the the the, the mortgage uh, default, right? So there is there is a link between the two, right? So after a bit not cut event, of course, the, the uh, I, I would say there is a lot of this foreclosures, right? And uh, they happen because the, the the market value of, of the buildings uh, fall down. So so the, the banks now are starting to really understand. Wow, this is maybe a risk I need to understand as well. And uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of of linking the, the two because it could. Uh, increase also the level of protection from that perspective. Yes, uh, speaking about businesses, I would like to ask you, Mr. Grad, uh, now climate change, if combined with the uh, transborder um, supply chains in many industries, can uh, can result in uh, uh, significant financial effects in totally other geography than that where the risk has actually occurred. Uh, we have seen that uh, classical already cases of the uh, uh, car manufacturers uh, in Europe being uh, waiting for some very small devices coming, coming from Thailand where the floods have destroyed the, the uh, 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 manufacturer and so on and so forth. Uh, how is insurance capturing this kind of effect? And I'm especially referring not to the very big level of the very big corporations, rather to more uh, modest manufacturers, but who are also depending on the supply chains internationally. I'm uh, very sorry that you are trying to to take a look on the, uh, let's say, uh, the small production factories, because uh, for this type of players, again, the insurance market do not uh, offer uh, uh, solution. Uh, supply chain insurance, it is available on the market from uh, from few years, and uh, this solution provides coverage for business interruption caused by disruption uh, in the block in, in the supply chain. And uh, in addition of this, uh, of the basics coverage, uh, they can uh, they, they they can be covered also by property damage, which could be caused by net cut, of course, to suppliers itself or downstream customers' business. Uh, and cover losses caused by a wide range of events, including natural disasters, industrial accidents, I don't know, library issues, strikes, uh, production process complex uh, problems, political uh, situation, war, civil strike, uh, riot, uh, including uh, public health emergency like the current pandemic uh, uh, situation. Uh, insolvencies, financial. So the area of uh, of uh, risk insured in supply chain insurance policy is very, very wide and is covering all the territories, uh, which could impact the production of the factories, uh, of, of the client factory, actually, or the client business, because don't have to be only a factory, could be a distribution, could be a, a different type of commercial business uh, who pursue, who uh, ask for import goods and the trading and things like that. So uh, usually they could more than companies right now. They do not have a single supplier. Most of the cases they have multiple supply, suppliers, and uh, this multi-tier coverage 
can be offered also by the, uh, by the insurance market. But uh, considering the condition <laughs> of the insurance, the complex risk assessment to a procedure and the long duration of the assessment process limit access to the SMEs, unfortunately, companies this product. So uh, it is very complicated and very difficult to, to, to offer a solution for them. On the other hand, customers are not very aware of the importance of this coverage. But uh, I think, I guess, this pandemic period shows to all producers the critical impact on the supply chain caused by the pandemic. And why not the, the blockade of the uh, Swiss Channel, for example, uh, something that nobody thought that it's possible to happen. Uh, so certainly, uh, the, certainly uh, the concern of this coverage will uh, increase on both sides, insurers and insured as well. And in this context, our expectation is to see in near future an increased number of companies offering this type of coverage as well as more accessible solution for customer. But uh, as I told you, it's, uh, it's a hope. So there is solution from very large players like Parametrics, the same range of, uh, of players uh, are offering solution in a very complex way and uh, very complicated to access by the client. Well, I uh, really hope that your hopes will fulfill. <laughs> and, uh, the hope I see... last. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Well, uh, uh, unfortunately our time is, uh, we are going out of time for, for this meeting, but uh, I wouldn't uh, leave you before asking you to, let's say, draw a short conclusion of this very rich day. Uh, we have touched several aspects from very particular ones to very general ones. If you would have to choose one thing, what would be that? Samantha, let's start with you. Okay, so my, my key takeaway would be data. Um, it's pretty much always data, but I think once you, you know and understand your risk, you can communicate it effectively, then ultimately your, your options are endless in terms of the financial instruments that can be developed. It can be used for um, at a simpler level, informing public zoning measures stress testing um, financial markets, so paying attention to um, your default risk and so on. Um, so that's, that's very much what, what I would focus on. One point that I would like to, to highlight um, that's coming up in the, the G7 dialogue is um, it's very much being pushed the concept um, of development insurance. And I think making sure that we've got data that can develop some mutually beneficial arrangement between the public and the private sector, um, I think we have a lot of options. Thank you. Mr. Grad. The safety of the property, because NatCat is mainly on the property of course, human life, it is involved as well. Uh, I think it's critical for everybody, individuals or companies. So uh, the protection of uh, our assets being managers or individuals, it should be our main concern. Easy or complicated with or without gap in coverage, deductible and some other potential limitation on the market, depend on each of them. Any kind of insurance is better than not insured at all. So uh, having uh, such a low penetration of, of the property insurance, mainly on an on a, on a individual's area, uh, the main concern should be to act and to sign an insurance policy for your house. Okay, we will try to do it. <laughs> Laurent, your conclusion? Yeah, very, very shortly. I think, uh, I mean, on the modeling perspective, again, I mean, as a model vendor, I would say, I, would just, I can just echo the data side, right? But I would say it's more the completeness or making every risk known or increasing the, the confidence in, in today's and tomorrow's risk landscape. This confidence element is very important in every aspect. It's not only about the analytics, it's the confidence about the, the process, the, the system, the, the regulation, the it's a it's one of the key word right uh, for every stakeholders confidence yes well this is uh, uh, constructive i would say confidence communication yes uh, and putting uh, some action in place before anything else 
thank you very much to our panelists for their conclusions, for their presentations also. Uh, from my part, what can I say? It is clear that this topic is a complex one. Uh, NETCAT risks are not only complex, but in a constant evolution and uh, climate change has add some additional uh, pressure on that. And uh, this is why I think that uh, having a better protection in place, it's something that uh, it's uh, changing from it would be good having it to it is a must having it. And uh, this is why all stakeholders, institutions, insurers, public policy makers, et cetera, should uh, come together and put some uh, new solutions in place. This being said, thank you very much to our speakers, to our guests for today. It is already very late. Uh, I want to, to remind you that the recording of this conference will remain on YouTube and it's available there. Where allowed, we will also uh, upload the presentation of the conference website and you can uh, see them there. And uh, we hope it was interesting, it was useful and you will join us for the next time to another interesting topic here from uh, the Extreme Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can see everything that we are doing. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks everyone, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. thank bye. you. Bye.